All-Star Pre-Game Show is brought to you by Sharp View Cam, the new movement in camcorders. And by Sprint, we've got everything you need, local, long distance, and cellular, to let you be there now. The city of Pittsburgh all a glitter for hosting the All-Star Game, and it has done a fine job this week. Just a few moments ago down here on the field, Meatloaf, who will be singing the national anthem on the left, and yes, that is Phil Rizzuto, honorary American League captain on the right, separated at birth. We don't think so. Welcome back to Pittsburgh, everyone. Topic of much discussion the first half of this season has been the pursuit of Roger Maris's home run record for a single season. There are three players in the record chase. Ken Griffey Jr., Frank Thomas, and Matt Williams. You see there the projections should they keep up their pace for the entire year. And I'm joined now by American League starters Frank Thomas of the Chicago White Sox, Ken Griffey Jr. of the Seattle Mariners. We saw how Roger Maris was affected by that whole home run chase. Do you think you could be affected by that, or has it perhaps affected you already? No, I'm, I'm going to go out and have fun. I mean, it's a situation. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, uh, you know, I can't worry about you know, the future, and I got, I got to take care of today, and that's uh, the most important thing for me to do. You didn't appear to have too many cares yesterday in winning the home run derby. You looked like you had fun. Well, you know, the real winners are the kids, uh, the kids who get the money and uh, the rights. So they're, they're the ones who are suffering. We're not, and we're just trying to put a show on for the fans. I mean, we're here for three days, and we're going to do the best job we can. Tell me what you thought about the one Frank Thomas hit. Well, the next time he decides he want to uh, make arrangements for a flight like that, I'd like to be on it and uh, ask him what movie he's showing. <laughs> Let me ask you. Frank, when you were when you were out here yesterday, you didn't appear to have a case of butterflies. You did a little while ago admit to having a case today. I got a big, big, big case of uh, butterflies tonight. Uh, it's my first start. Ken's a veteran of this game now, so you know it's something new for me. I'm just gonna go out and have a good time, though. Yeah. Are you having a good time whenever this topic of the home run chase comes up? I didn't think about it. You know, I I was sitting around thinking about it the other day. Uh, I have 32 home runs at the break, and I don't know how. But uh, you know, I've had a solid first half, but a first half doesn't make the season. So I just got to come out and just keep playing hard. You're putting up terrific numbers in home runs, batting average, and runs batted in. Is there any one of those categories that you would prefer to excel in over the other? Not really. I used to really love the RBI situation, but now I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the average race thing. Uh, you know, I've always hit for a high average, but I never really thought about it. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really too particular in any one of the categories. All right. Frank Thomas, Ken Griffey Jr. Good luck to you tonight. We'll take a time out here when we come back. Matt Williams of the San Francisco Giants joins us when we continue from Three River Stadium in just a moment. The 1994 All-Star Pre-Game Show is brought to you by Chevrolet Trucks, the most dependable, longest-lasting trucks on the road. And by Sharp View Cam, the new movement in camcorders. Welcome back to Pittsburgh, and there is Three Rivers Stadium, where just moments ago, the wife of the late Roberto Clemente, Mrs. Vera Clemente, presented to Dave Winfield of the Minnesota Twins the Roberto Clemente Award, which goes to a player for contributions both on and off the baseball field. I'm joined now by Matt Williams of the San Francisco Giants. We showed you his numbers, and congratulations on the season you're having, Matt. Are you enjoying your part in this whole home run chase? Yes, I am. I think that uh, I never expected to be here in this in this chase, but I will enjoy it uh, until the end, and, and it'll be fun to watch uh, as the games go on and as the season progresses uh, how close any of us uh, can get to it. Do you get up in the morning and check the box scores and see what Frank Thomas and Ken Griffey have done? No, I hit my 33rd on uh, last Saturday, and uh, I didn't even know that I was tied with Ken until somebody told me after the game. So. You know, you worry about your own team so much that it's it's tough to to keep up with them too. You and your National League cohorts are on the long end of a six-game losing streak. What was the attitude in the clubhouse before you came out? Well, it's all a lot of fun, but when when 8:30 rolls around, we're going to go out there and try to beat these guys. You know, we've been hearing about it for the last six years, and it's about time that it stopped. Matt, thanks very much. Good luck to you tonight. Thank you. Matt Williams of the San Francisco Giants. If there is a cloud hanging over this game in general and this season in particular, it is that of a possible baseball player strike. Now, a strike date has not yet been set. Earlier today, I talked with Paul Molitor of the Toronto Blue Jays and asked him if he feels it's harmful to talk about a player walkout date. 
Well, I don't think it's really harmful to talk about it. I think the most uh, common attitude amongst players is sometime between the middle of August and the first of September. You know, it's a difficult thing to do. We want to give the uh, the talks every chance to succeed. And if you go too late, you put yourself in a small little box and make it difficult. On the other hand, if you go too early, it sometimes give uh, the other side a little bit too much of a comfort zone to negotiate very quickly. So uh, we're trying to look at some time in that period and figure out what's best to find a solution for everyone involved. There has been so much gloom and doom about the situation. What do you rate the chances of a player strike this summer? Well, to tell you the truth, I think there's a good chance that there will be a strike, unfortunately. And why I say that is that history has taught me that one of the things the owners like to do before they negotiate fairly is to see if the players are unified. And the only way for them to find that out is if, indeed, they let the players go out and see if there's any division amongst players. But hopefully, once they find that unification, which I indeed expect that they will, uh, we can go ahead and make some quick progress and try to make this as short a work stoppage as possible. One of the big issues that stands between baseball's players and owners is that of a salary cap. Ironically, that is the very issue which is being contested in a New York courtroom these days between the National Basketball Players Association and the NBA owners. Today, a New York judge admonished both sides to settle the issue out of court. Otherwise, he will issue his ruling in two days. The baseball world will be watching closely. We'll take a time out here, and when we come back to Three River Stadium, you will meet the players who will take part in the 65th all-star baseball game. Circling over the Three Rivers area tonight, the Goodyear Blimp Spirit of Akron. This is the 70th year Goodyear Blimps have covered the nation's top sporting events. And now for the introduction of the All-Stars in tonight's 65th All-Star Baseball game, public address announcer Tim DeBacco. The trainers from the Cleveland Indians, Paul Spicuza. From the Milwaukee Brewers, John Adam. The batting practice staff from the Toronto Blue Jays, Bob Baylor. And in the bullpen, Gene Tennis and Galen Sisko. The coaches from the Chicago White Sox, Gene Lamont. From the Cleveland Indians, Mike Hargrove. And now the American League non starters. From the Baltimore Orioles, Pitcher Mike Messina. Pitcher Lee Smith. From the Boston Red Sox, third baseman Scott Cooper. From the California Angels, outfielder Chili Davis. From the Chicago White Sox, pitcher Wilson Alvarez. Pitcher Jason Beret. From the Cleveland Indians, outfielder Kenny Lofton. Outfielder Albert Bell. From the Detroit Tigers, catcher Mickey Tettleton. Third baseman Travis Fryman. From the Kansas City Royals, pitcher David Cohn. From the Milwaukee Brewers, Pitcher Ricky Bonus. From the Minnesota Twins, second baseman Chuck Knobloch. From the New York Yankees, outfielder Paul O'Neill. From the Oakland Athletics, outfielder Ruben Sierra. From the Seattle Mariners, pitcher Randy Johnson. From the Texas Rangers, first baseman Will Clark. From the Toronto Blue Jays, outfielder Paul Molitor. Pitcher Pat Henkin. And now, tonight's starting lineup for the American League. 
First, the manager of the American League. From the world champion Toronto Blue Jays, Cito Gaston. Leading off, the second baseman from the Toronto Blue Jays, Roberto Alomar. Batting second, the third baseman from the New York Yankees, Wade Boggs. Batting third, the center fielder from the Seattle Mariners, Ken Griffey Jr. Batting fourth, the first baseman from the Chicago White Sox, Frank Thomas. Batting fifth, the left fielder from the Toronto Blue Jays, Joe Carter. Batting sixth, the right fielder from the Minnesota Twins, Kirby Puckett. Batting seventh, the shortstop from the Baltimore Orioles, Cal Ripken Jr. from the Texas Rangers, Yvonne Rodriguez. And batting ninth, and warming up in the bullpen, from the New York Yankees, pitcher Jimmy Key. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1994 American League All-Stars. And for the National League. The trainers from the Pittsburgh Pirates, Kent Biggerstaff. From the San Francisco Giants, Mark Laton. The batting practice staff from the Philadelphia Phillies, John Vukovic. And in the bullpen, Johnny Padres. The coaches from the Colorado Rockies, Don Baylor. From the Pittsburgh Pirates, Jim Leland. Francisco Giants, Dusty Baker. Now the non-starters for the Atlanta Braves. First baseman, Fred McGriff. From the Chicago Cubs, pitcher, Randy Myers. From the Cincinnati Reds, shortstop, Barry Larkin. Pitcher, Jose Rijo. From the Colorado Rockies, outfielder Dante Bichette. From the Florida Marlins, outfielder Jeff Conine. 
from the Houston Astros first baseman Jeff Bagwell second baseman Greg Biggio third baseman Ken Caminetti pitcher Doug Drabeck John Hudak from the Montreal Expos outfielder Marquis Grissom shortstop Will Cordero outfielder Moises Alou catcher Darren Fletcher pitcher Ken Hill from the New York Mets, pitcher Brett Saberhagen. From the Philadelphia Phillies, pitcher Doug Jones. Pitcher Danny Jackson. From the Pittsburgh Pirates, second baseman Carlos Garcia. San Francisco Giants pitcher Rod Beck from the Philadelphia Phillies voted as a starter to the all-star team but unable to play due to injury outfielder Lenny Dykstra and now tonight's starting lineup for the National League First, the manager from the National League champion, Philadelphia Phillies, Jim Fragosi. Leading off, the first baseman from the St. Louis Cardinals, Greg Jeffries. Second, the center fielder from the San Diego Padres, Tony Gwynn. Batting third, the left fielder from the San Francisco Giants, Barry Bonds. Second baseman from the Philadelphia Phillies, Mariano Duncan. Batting eighth, the shortstop from the St. Louis Cardinals, Ozzie Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask you now to please rise. 
Presenting the colors of Canada and the United States is the United States Air Force Honor Guard. And here to sing O Canada is Margot Timmons of the popular Canadian group Cowboy Junkies. He sings the Star Spangled Banner. get the feeling the fireworks have only just begun. We'll join Bob Costas, Bob Euchre, and Joe Morgan for the call of the 65th All-Star Game after these messages from your local station.
opened up some of the seats that normally aren't available for baseball for this All-Star game, increased the capacity by some 10,000, so better than 58,000 are on hand in this sellout crowd tonight for the 65th renewal of the All-Star game. Welcome back up to the booth and the first time to say hello to my new partners, Mr. Baseball, Bob Euchre, and Hall of Famer, Joe Morgan, two-time MVP, 10-time selectee to the All-Star game. Can you offer a memory or two of this game? Well, it would have to be the 1977 game at Yankee Stadium, Bob. I had just returned from viewing the monuments in left field. I let it off. I hit a home run. And as I was trotting around the bases, I was thinking to myself, Babe Ruth made this journey quite often. And it was very exciting. And I don't even think I touched the bases. I can't remember that. You see Reggie there leaning disconsolately <laughs> against the wall. Jim Palmer, by the way, served up the home run pitch. Now, in your case, you I realize this isn't fair to ask you to narrow it down to a single moment, but an all-star memory for you? Well, it would have to be uh, 1966 for me, Bob. The St. Louis Cardinals invited me back for the all-star oh, yeah. game that year. I worked the concession stands on a very hot day and uh, really didn't catch a break there either. They gave me hot chocolate. I mean, I couldn't believe it, 106 degrees. A typical bad break. A setback a for you, you. What a day. Well, you know, your old mates once were riding an 11 game winning streak. You were part of that. Now the National Leaguers have lost six in a row. Your thoughts on that? Well, if you look at this game on paper, the American League should win simply because of their depth and their power. But since we're going to play this game, attitude becomes important. And when I traveled through the clubhouse, the National Leaguers all felt like this was their year. And the biggest thing they felt like, they have the best pitcher in baseball going for them tonight in Greg Maddox. Well, Cito Gaston felt the same way. He was adamant about it, as a matter of fact. When you're talking about people like Frank Thomas, Ken Griffey, Kirby Puckett, Joe Carter, Cal Ripken Jr., and I think Yvonne Rodriguez, one of the all's really outstanding catchers in all of baseball, Joe, I'm taking the Americans to make it seven straight, buddy. <laughs> Here's a look at the American League lineup put together by Cito Gaston and faced tonight by starter Greg Maddox, Roberto Alomar at second base. From the Blue Jays, the Yankees, Wade Boggs at third. Ken Griffey Jr. starts in center field for the fifth consecutive year. Frank Thomas, and we'll tell you about his truly remarkable numbers when he comes to the plate. The White Sox first baseman will hit cleanup. Joe Carter in left, the game-winning home run for in the World Series last year against the Phillies. Kirby Puckett, an all-star perennial, is in right field from the Twins. Cal Ripken Jr you're making a record 11th consecutive start at shortstop for the American League. Yvonne Rodriguez, the Texas Rangers young catcher, second all-star appearance at age 22, and Jimmy Key from the Yankees with a record of 13 and 2 will pitch. Ozzy Smith is standing at shortstop. For the National League, he's the oldest player in the game, but still spry. This might be his last All-Star game, so he sees the moment. The trademark flip when he hit the diamond at Three Rivers. Do it, wizard. <laughs> the shadows growing longer for Ozzie Smith at age 39. Roberto Alomar stands in, and Maddox starts him with a strike. How appropriate that the first hitter in this All-Star game should hail from Puerto Rico, the homeland of the great Roberto Clemente. They dedicated a statue to him outside Three Rivers earlier this week. The 0-1 pitch. Moves him back one and one. The plate umpire is Paul Rungi from the National League. John Shulock of the American League at first. Jerry Lane, National League at second. Rocky Rowe, American League at third. Bill Hahn of the National League, left field. Jim Joyce of the Americans, right field. And Alomar drops a bunt, but it rolls foul. Alomar hitting 313. Appearing in his fifth All-Star game, one for San Diego. Four in the American League as a representative of the Blue Jays. Piazza with the sign. Maddox, as usual, ahead on the count. Hit to Ozzy. Easy for the Wizard. One down to his Cardinal teammate, Greg Jeffers. Joe, let's take a look at the National League defensive. Well, Barry Bonds in left field. Tony Gwynn, normally a right fielder who's won a gold glove in center. Justice in right. William Smith on the left side. Duncan and Jeffries on the right. Piazza behind the mound. And Maddox on, on the mound. Wade Boggs hitting 331 with nine homers. Likes to look at several pitches usually. Takes one at the knees for a strike. This will be the 12th time in a 13 year career that Boggs hits better than 300. Hits this one toward the middle and Ozzie can't flag it down. 
Boggs is a 350 hitter in nine previous All-Star games, and he starts this one with a hit. The fastball from Maddox right down the middle, and Boggs right on it. Hit it in the center. You said a moment ago, Bob, the guy takes pitches left and right, strike one, strike two. I don't know if there's a better two-strike hitter in the game, but he's amongst the best, I guarantee you that. So Boggs at first with one down for Ken Griffey Jr. with Frank Thomas on deck. Jr. won the home run derby here yesterday with seven of them. And here's a drive into the gap in left center field and Gwynn won't get to it. It splits them and goes to the wall. Boggs on his way to third and stopped there by Gene Lamont, the White Sox manager who's coaching at third. Junior liked the first pitch he saw, Joe, goes the opposite way, and he has tremendous power in that direction for the two-bagger. Well, Greg Maddox usually features a fastball and a changeup. You can't tell the difference sometimes. He starts Griffey off with a fastball, and he gets it up, and Griffey just laces it in the gap in left center field. No chance for anyone to run that one down. The pursuit of Roger Maris has him at 33 at midseason, same as Matt Williams of the National League. One better than this guy, Frank Thomas of the White Sox. Maris had 33 at the break in 1961 when he caught Ruth. And there's a fastball for a strike to Thomas. How many power hitters you take as many pitches as Thomas does? You know, there's an argument about that. Uh, you won't get it from Frank Thomas, though, Bob. He's one of those guys that uh, is disciplined. He says no matter what the situation is, runners aboard, he's going to take pitches that he doesn't think he can handle. I think a lot of people think he ought to swing at more pitches. I mean, balls that he can reach that are reachable for him to pick up RBIs. Off the outside edge and low, the American Leaguers threatening in the top of the first. Boggs at third, Griffey at second. Yeah, that guy at Chicago hitting behind him, Julio Franco, is having a heck of a year because of it. A ball and a strike to the big hurt. And Maddox steps off and wants to confer with Piazza. That'll give us a chance to put the numbers back up for Frank Thomas. His on base percentage is better than 500. Look at that slugging percentage. If he maintains that, listen carefully. Only one man in baseball history will have slugged higher in a single season, and his name is Babe Ruth. And he did it only twice with back to back seasons in 1920 and 21, over 800. He hits it right on the nose, and Gwynn comes charging in and can't make the play. Scoring from third is Boggs. Griffey stops at third, and we'll see how they score it. Now remember, Gwynn has played only one game in center field in the last five years, and that was Sunday, just to get him ready for this All-Star game. He had to replace Lenny Dykstra in the starting lineup, and he played Sunday, the last game before the break, in center against the Expos. Here it is again, a sinking line drive off the bat. That ball's short hopping. It hit, looked like it hit the turf first. Get another look. Yep. It's a base hit. And an RBI for Frank Thomas. So the American League trying to extend a six game winning streak in front one nothing three consecutive hits off Maddox here's Carter and he swings on the first one they're wasting little time. Well Greg Maddox comes right after you John I mean Bob he does not fall behind many hitters an early tribute to John <laughs> Miller your partner on ESPN the great Oriole announcer at least it's out of the way. OK get it out of the way. <laughs> here's the L1 to Carter. Line and Maddox grabs it and there's the DP. Maddox is a terrific fielding pitcher. And he helped himself there. They scalded the ball against him in this inning. But the DP bails him out with only one run scoring. National Leaguers coming up. The 1994 All-Star Game is brought to you by Budweiser, Beachwood Aged for a crisp, clean, classic taste. By MCI, the company that brings you proof positive. And by Oldsmobile and your local Oldsmobile retailers. Bottom of the 
first coming up in Three Rivers. There's a Pennsylvania boy, the Bills quarterback, Jim Kelly. Training camp still a ways off, and tonight's National League lineup presented by Budweiser. Greg Jeffries from the town where they brew Bud. St. Louis will lead it off. Gwyn Bonds Piazza to follow. Williams Justice, Duncan Smith, and the pitcher Maddox, the four-time Gold Glove award-winning Maddox, who got himself out of a tough first inning by starting the line drive DP. Jeffries, the former Met and Royal switch hitter, batting right against Key. Fastball high to start it. Jeffries averaged fifth best in the National League. Hit 342 in his first season as a Cardinal in 93. And the fastball is walloped down the line and left. One hop off the wall. Carter to play the carom. Jeffries with a leadoff double. You got two guys starting who are prime Cy Young Award candidates, but this one looks like a candidate for a slugfest. Well, again, Joe talked earlier about the high fastballs from Maddox. This is a high fastball from Jimmy Key right down Main Street, and Jeffries right on it. Carter, no chance to play this ball. Off the wall, it's an easy double for Jeffries. Tying run at second. For Tony Gwynn, whose 383 average leads the National League, ties him with Frank Thomas for the Major League's best. And he takes a strike at the knees. Four-time batting titleist. This will be the 12th consecutive year. He's top 300, longest streak in the National League since Musial did it 16 straight times. Bonds on deck. A ball and a strike. You know, Joe, we were talking about the pursuit of 400. You've got an interesting point of view. Well, I believe that if you had Rod Carew, George Brett playing today, one of those two guys would hit over 400. And Wade Boggs would have an outside chance if he was in his prime. With the level of pitching the way it is right now. He exactly. jammed him on that one, and Thomas is going to take it himself. But Jeffries advances to third with one out. Met there by the Pirate manager, Jim Leland, who got a rousing ovation from the hometown fans. He's coaching at third base for Jim Fregosi. Now it's Carter, Griffey, and Puckett in the outfield left to right. Boggs at third, Ripken at short. Alomar at second with Big Frank Thomas at first. It's Ivan Rodriguez catching. And left-hander Jimmy Keon for the Americans. Bond stands in, not so warmly greeted by his ex-hometown fans. And he drives one to right, but he didn't get all of it. Back on the track is Kirby Puckett, and a strider so from the wall, he makes the catch. Credit Bonds with a sacrifice fly as Jeffries comes across to tie it at one apiece. Well, both of these pitches are very similar. They rely on the off-speed pitches and the breaking ball. This is a breaking ball to Bonds. You can see him check for a second and then take a powerful cut. He just misses this ball. Now watch, he'll take a stride and then he'll stop again. Right there, he holds himself to wait on the breaking ball and then he tries to muscle it out and he can't quite get it out. How important that little ground ball hit by Tony Gwynn, though, Joe, to get the runner to the third. And a strike to the cleanup man. Mike Piazza, the last time any catcher, with all due respect to Fisk and Munson and the others, any catcher put up numbers like Piazza has in his first season and a half, it was your old teammate, Johnny Bench, Joe. The off-speed pitch hit to the right side, and Frank Thomas takes the soft liner. So the Nationals come back to even it, tied at one after one. It'll be Puckett, Ripken, and Rodriguez to face Greg Maddox as we start the second. Score tied at one and a strike from Maddox. He's 28 years old. Great command of all of his pitches. Cut fastball, slider, the circle change with drop action. He'll throw any of them at any point on the count. Kirby swings and misses. a career 319 hitter.
right around there at 321, leading the league in RBIs, MVP of last year's All-Star Game in an American League win at Baltimore. Outside for ball one. works one and two got in on his fist slow roller Matt Williams cuts in front of Ozzie very sure handed third baseman from the Giants he's got a couple of gold gloves on his shelf very good defensive third baseman great hands and a very accurate arm and when Ger Greg Maddox gets ahead of you very rarely do you get a pitch to hit now this is Matt Williams charging throws on the run very accurate. Overlooked and all the hubbub about Griffey and Thomas, who have better overall numbers. But when it comes to hitting them out, Matt Williams is right there with 33 at the break. And as a matter of fact, did not participate in yesterday's home run hitting contest due to a little, little bad back, a little bit of a back problem, decline. But uh, you know, it was interesting when you were talking to him, Bob, about the fact that despite the 33 home runs. He's, uh, he's not totally satisfied with what he's hitting and the RBI count. Ripken wasn't satisfied with what he was doing last year at this time. 229 at the break, although he started in his home park of Camden Yards. Cuts and misses. But this year he's up to 306. And he is now 147 games. Behind Lou Gehrig's once unassailable mark of 2,130 consecutive games played, assuming no strike, which is a huge assumption, he could break it in late June of next season. The 1 2 pitch. You know, we take it for granted like he's in the home stretch, a piece of cake, 147 games. Maybe for him, but there are only three players active in the major leagues right now with a streak as long as 147 to put in perspective what this guy has done. Maddox's one two pitch breaking ball outside two and two. You know as a player or an ex player Bob I think you can really appreciate what Ripken has done. I don't know if the average fan really really can appreciate the consecutive game streak. I mean the times that he's been hit I know he's I've seen him drilled a couple of times where it looked like he might have to leave the game or not be able to play the next day but he always comes back. Barb you're getting a real look at the real Greg Maddox now he's struggling in the first inning. I'm sure he was a little nervous making his first start and now you see the hitters not getting good swings at him when he gets ahead in the count he never gives you a pitch to hit. Hasn't done that well in previous all star outings. Ken Griffey Jr. took him deep in San Diego a couple of years ago. Another 2 2 pitch to Ripken. A chopper to Duncan and Mariano Duncan. We talk about all the young stars, but here's the flip side. Appears in his first all star game. In this, his ninth season in the big leagues. He's been playing a lot of third base for Jim Fergosi in the Phillies with Dave Collins on the disabled list. But voted the starter at second after the retirement of Ryan Sandberg. This is the first time since 1985 anyone other than Sandberg has started at second base for the National League. It was Tommy Herr of the pennant winning Cardinals in 1985. Here's Rodriguez. Two out, nobody on, and a swing and a miss. Well, I tell you, I love watching this kid catch, Bob. He's one of the best throwers I've ever seen. Uh, runners don't take liberties with this guy, and I'm not talking only about stealing bases. He loves to throw to any base, any situation. Uh, he'll try to pick you off. Loves to throw. We can see the numbers, including the fact that he's thrown out almost half of would-be base stealers, I which is a terrific catch. percentage. But how good a handler of pitchers is he calling a game? I think he's very good. I really do. There's a breaking ball fouled off. He's uh, he's a strong kid. He, he's he's going to get better. He's only 22 years old, but uh, you know to put him on a club like the Texas Rangers, they've got tremendous power, pitching staff, so so. They lead the West. But I'll tell you, ever since I saw this kid, his, uh, his first game in the big leagues, liked his action, good behind the plate. As I said, he loves to throw. 
And he takes a fastball high. Jimmy Key is scheduled to work only two innings. So if Rodriguez doesn't reach, Key won't bat. But no DH in this game taking place in a National League park. So Key, who has never had a regular season at bat his whole career in the American League, is on deck. Called strike three at the knees. So Rodriguez makes a left turn, heads back to the dugout, and Maddox, after a shaky first, sets them down in order in the second. It's been 21 years since Roberto Clemente perished in a plane crash on a mission of mercy from his native Puerto Rico to try and aid the earthquake victims in Nicaragua. New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1972. But what a presence in the imagination of Pittsburghers. They don't have to be baseball fans to revere Clemente. Matt Williams stands in and cuts and misses at Key's first offering in the last half of the second. You still see a lot of kids who weren't born when Roberto got his 3,000th and last hit wearing number 21 jerseys around this town. Williams will be followed by Justice and Duncan. Game tied at one. And that'll make the seats. That's Vera Clemente in the middle, Roberto's widow, and some of the children, grandchildren. A singular player. His passion for the game was palpable. You could feel it. You'd be watching a game on television, you could feel his heart beating through the screen. The 0 2 pitch. Struck him out on three pitches. Well, both these pitchers use the off-speed pitches to keep the hitters off balance. He wasn't fooled by the break of the ball there. He's fooled by the speed. Now watch. This is a slow curveball. He tries to wait on it. Can't wait. Good pitch there by Jimmy Key. Talk about the ultimate craftsman. Changing speeds, taking whatever the umpires will give him, move a little bit inside, outside, depending upon how wide a strike zone they're giving him on that particular night. 33 years old, once the backbone of the Blue Jays staff. Second year in New York. On the outside corner, at the knees to Justice. That's exactly the way he works, Bob. He'll start you off the outside corner. If it's ball one, he'll come in a little bit more. Ball two, he'll come in a little more. If it's going to be a strike in that area, that's where he'll stay all night long. Tommy John type little sinker little breaking ball he's never won 20 was 18 and 6 last year consistently in the mid teens for those excellent Blue Jay teams he pitched for in the 80s and early 90s and another strike to justice one and two that's what you're talking about right there Bob just a little bit above the knees. David Cohn of the Royals will follow him to the mound. A starter can work three innings, but Cito says he'll use Jimmy Key only two. On the other hand, Jim Fregosi told us Greg Maddox would work the full three unless he came to bat before that. So the National Leaguers would have to put two men on for Maddox's spot to come up. And in that case, Fregosi would hit for him. And either next inning or the one after Ken Hill of Montreal will follow him. Just is trying to wait on that one, but he just lost a soft fly ball to Ken Griffey Jr. in center. His 13th game just before the break when he threw a five hitter against the Padres. Two down, nobody on. Mariano Duncan. Takes a strike. Jimmy Key is the first Yankee to start an All-Star game since Mel Stottlemyre in 1969, and that was a fluke. The game was scheduled for a Tuesday night in Washington, rained out. Denny McLean, that ball hit back a third. Wade Boggs, long throw. Frank Thomas, terrific play to come up with it. And we will tell you of Denny McLean's exploits when we come back. That's a beauty right here. Throws from foul territory. 
and Thomas does a split to record the out. The 1994 All-Star Game is brought to you by Budweiser, Beachwood Aged for a crisp, clean, classic taste. By Chevrolet, the cars and trucks 36 million people depend on every day. Genuine Chevrolet. And by Nike, who encourages you to participate in the lives of America's youth. One run on three hits for the Americans. One run on a lone hit for the Nationals. Maddox will work the full three if he can get through this inning. Paul Molitor pinch hits, batting for Jimmy Key, and that's his one swing of the night because he won't play the field. So Paul Molitor grounds out to Greg Jeffries unassisted to start the third, and we go down to the American League dugout where we're joined by Hannah Storm. Hannah. Hi, Bob. Well, Jimmy, how was it out there? You said you didn't know what to expect when you went out. Well, it was, wasn't was quite as bad as I thought, but, uh, you know, I was just trying to throw the ball over the plate and get it over with, and uh, they hit six balls at people, and I was able to get six outs and only gave up the one run, so it wasn't that bad. What was the highlight for you? I think probably the last out I got to get it over with, and now I can move on with the, with the regular season. We uh, talked about the fact that when you were a kid, you never envisioned being in an all-star game because you didn't think that, that you would be here. But now that you look back on it, will you treasure this later? Yes, I will. You know, once I'm, my career is over, uh, this is definitely something I'll look back on. It's uh, one of the highlights of my career. Good luck to you and the Yankees in the second half. Thank Bob? You. Well, Hannah Mariano Duncan stayed with that one. And from what would be the outfield grass on a natural surface field, he throws Robbie Alomar out. Well, Mariano Duncan's a very good second baseman. Not so good at third, but he's good at second. Knocks the ball down. At second, you can do this. Knock it down, pick him up, and throw him out. And again, he's very deep. Just blocks the ball. Gets a good hop off the AstroTurf, and he's able to throw Roberto Alomar out. Boggs singled and scored in the first and takes a strike. You mentioned that if he were at his very peak, and to keep it in perspective, he's hitting 331, Joe, but at his very peak in the mid 80s, where he had that stretch hitting around 360 almost every year, you thought he could hit 400 against this year's level of pitching. In fact, he hit 401 in a 162 game stretch from mid 1985 to mid 1986. I believe both Boggs, Brett, and of course Rod Carew, all three could probably do that. And I, I no doubt in my mind that Carew could hit 400 with the pitching as it is today. I think he's a little more scientific hitter than the other two. And Tony Wynn hit 399 from last July 1st to this June 30th. So in the vicinity. Two and two. What about that guy at first base uh, tonight for the Americans, Joe? We talked about him yesterday, too. I mean, as many times as he walks uh, and playing on the artificial surfaces that are featured in a lot of parks now. I mean, watching that guy day in and day out, you'd think he'd have to be included in that, uh, in that trio also. A called strike three finishes Boggs. Tough start for Maddox, but he works two perfect innings to close. So, Greg Gumbel debuts this September as host of NFL Live. We've got a new pitcher as we move to the bottom of the third, David Cohn, for the American League. And he's going to face Ozzie Smith to start it. And before Ozzie steps in, let's hear what his counterpart at shortstop, the Orioles' Cal Ripken, says about the Wizard. I'm very envious because I'm a big, cumbersome type of person, and I have to really rely on my positioning to, to cover this ground. Here he is as someone that is very graceful and quick, and he stands right in the middle saying, if it's a left-hand hitter or a right-hand hitter, I can catch that, I can catch this, I can make all the plays. So I enjoy watching all the different types of shortstops, and most of the time I'm envious of their abilities. He's the one I think everyone's envious of. Ripken had a year once where he made only three errors, and that's the record. Ozzie jumps on the first pitch. And a meek fly ball to center field that Ken Griffey Jr. takes care of. Ozzie defined the position for a generation, though. 13 gold gloves. And his election this year, when Barry Larkin is really the superior player at this point, Ozzie, 39 years old, is kind of in the category of a lifetime achievement award, but he deserves it. You know, the first time I went, uh, went in the St. Louis with the, with the Brewers, Bob, in the 82 series, and saw this guy come out of the dugout, and do that flip going to shortstop and and drove the fans crazy in St. Louis. I mean, it was a big part of their win. This guy is really something, and, and to watch him do it here tonight, again, I tried it earlier during batting practice. No good. 
Does that hurt? <laughs> He'll be 40 the day after Christmas. Best guess is one more year. And then retirement, five years later, Cooperstown. Bagwell bats for Maddox. There are three players in this game. Bagwell from the Astros is at the plate now. Albert Bell from the Indians, whom we'll see later, and Frank Thomas of the White Sox, who have legitimate shots at the Triple Crown, which hasn't been won in either league since Carl Yastrzemski of the Red Sox in 67. Well, the problem is they have to fit, they have to beat each other out in the American League, both Bell and of course Thomas. Then you have Griffey leading in home runs. Bagwell fouls it back. He's hitting 348. I consider that number a right-handed hitter without much speed at 348. 27 homers in the Astrodome is his home park. 82 RBIs. Started out as the property of the Red Sox. A trade they no doubt regret. Full count. We watched watched him yesterday in the in the home run hitting contest following Ken Griffey Jr. and and the American League dugout going crazy and a pinch single for him here with one out in the third after Griffey hit about six balls in the upper deck Bagwell came on and tried to duplicate to left there was no chance Joe <laughs> he had a very tough act to follow. But the interesting thing about Bagwell is he has become a better hitter each year. These two have no excuse for not sending one another a birthday card. Each born May 27th, 1968. Bagwell in Boston, Thomas in Columbus, Georgia. Jeffrey swings at a pitch he wished he hadn't offered that. Does Rodriguez have room? It goes off his glove. He wasn't sure. Remember, he's an American leaguer, unfamiliar with this park, perhaps not sure where the lip of the dugout was or the fence, and he kind of stabbed at that ball at the last minute. Well, he's at his own dugout, Bob. He should have gotten a little more help there, but he had a lot more room than he thought. He was right near the, uh, the camera area down there. He jumped up, really didn't have to jump. That ball was in by plenty. Popped away, no play on him. There's Boggs right alongside. Jeffrey's a switch hitter. Double to left as a right handed batter off Jimmy Key earlier in the game and scored the National League run. There you see what David Cohn is famous for a good hard slider. Jeffrey started for it but broke in so sharply would have been jammed if he would have continued to swing. Tony Gwynn says of Cohn best stuff in the majors. I don't know why he doesn't win 30. One and two. Did it hit him? Yeah, it nicked him. Down the second goes Bagwell as Jeffries is hit by a pitch. And remember, it doesn't basketball. have to hit you. Just touch your uniform, and that's all it does there. Let's take another look and see. It just touches his uniform. It does not have to hit your body. And now with a runner at second, Rodriguez to talk it over with Cohn. They feel a lot better on the uniform than they do in the ribs, Joe. No doubt. We were talking earlier about it. The fact that here it is again. A little inside fastball, an 0-2 pitch from Cohn. And not a bad pitch at all. Not a bad zone. He just nicked the uniform of Jeffries. But he hit him. Gwynn grounded out his first time. Takes a fastball high. This may be Gwynn's best year overall because he's driving in runs he has 49 runs batted in which is a lot for him he probably surpassed his career high this year. He's the only Padre on the team but there are six former Padres combined in the game the most of any team which makes a statement about the state of their franchise. He's ahead 2 and 0 and that's when he's most dangerous. Hits it hard down the right field line and in there for extra bases. Bagwell scores. Jeffries with good speed to third. Leland waves him home. They have trouble with the carom. Alomar's relay. Safe. He slid around the tag. And Gwynn comes up with two RBIs on the double down the right field line. Great slide there by Jeffries at home plate. The throw actually beat him. Rodriguez could not block him off the plate. But you mentioned Tony Gwynn. When he gets you 2-0, he can take the ball any place he wants. He decides to pull it 
And he finds the corner. And now the ball will bounce away from Puckett. Puckett gets there. Now it bounces away. Jeffries being waved all the way. And watch the slide. Beautiful slide. Moving the tag of Rodriguez. Bonds had a sacrifice fly his first time. Swings on the first one and doesn't get it. Here it is again, Jeffries coming around the outside of Rodriguez. Rodriguez had to play blocked up front, Joe. He came around, Jeffries came around the outside. Look where he's got his foot. He's got the plate block. Jeffries with a beautiful slide to get the back part of the plate. There's that devastating slider from Cohen. With that downward action and Bonds just kind of waving at it. But the problem is it looks like a fastball until it gets about halfway to the plate. And you have to respect his fastball because he'll throw it right by you. Win at second one out. National League leads it three to one. There goes the bat. And there goes Bonds back to the dugout. Made to look foolish by David Cohn. And the fans here get on him. In contrast to Drabeck, a former Pirates Cy Young Award winner who left to go to Houston as a free agent, Bonds did the same after winning two of his three MVP awards wearing a Pirate uniform, and they booed him mercilessly during the introductions. Well, this looks more like a curveball. You can see the spin on it, a little more downward action, but just as effective as the two hard sliders to Bond. Piazza lines softly to Thomas at first to end the first for the National Leaguers. Who are in front now, three to one. Here's Bonds again, a devastating breaking ball that time. There goes the bat into the dugout. And guess who caught it? The golden <laughs> hands of, <laughs> the of Ozzie Smith. He can catch anything. The man who can bare hand a bat. <laughs> one and one. Bonds, of course, MVP three times in a four-year span and might have won it. The one year he didn't when Terry Pendleton got it for the Braves. Great year for Pendleton, but you could have made a case for Bonds. Piazza serves one in the left center field. Didn't hit it all that hard, but in a good spot. He's got an RBI as Gwynn comes across. Another breaking ball from David Cohn that stayed up. Piazza waiting back nicely. He didn't hit it all that hard, but he got enough of it. For the RBI base hit. Here it is again. A little breaking ball that time. He reached out and punched that ball. Get it up above hitting. the trademark. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you look at Piazza. Here's a guy who was a 62nd round draft choice. A called strike to Matt Williams. I'm not talking about the 62nd player. I'm talking about 62nd round, widely viewed as a courtesy pick because his dad Vince is a close pal of Tommy Lasorda's. He develops possibly into one of the great players of his generation. After a year and a half, all the signs are there. Well, if you're 62nd or 72nd, it's better than being drafted where I was. <laughs> Which was where? Into the Navy? Service. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stepping on you. are stealing your lines here. <laughs> Sorry, I just guessed. It was on our side. That's all I counted at that time. <laughs> <laughs> one and one to Williams. Waited for scouts for years. And he couldn't catch up with the heat from Cone. What's that story about when the scout came to your house talking to your dad? Oh yeah, when they signed me. Yeah. Oh yeah, the three thousand dollar bonus. Yeah. My dad couldn't afford it, but he gave it up. <laughs> Braves took it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was great to be signed. That's that's all that mattered. I'll tell you, David Cohn will give you some very uncomfortable at bats, especially if you're not used to looking at him. But they punch three across. Back after this from your local station. Under the command of captains Lee Bradbury and Russ Adams, the MetLife Blimp is providing aerial shots of the All-Star Game live from Three Rivers. The MetLife Blimp travels over 60,000 miles a year, covering sporting events and specials. Changes now for the National League. 
Ken Hill is the new pitcher succeeding Maddox who gave up a run in the first and then worked a perfect second and third. And we'll tell you about the others after the first pitch to Ken Griffey Jr. which is a called strike. Bagwell who had a pinch single to start the rally in the bottom of the third stays in the game and plays first base. And the lone pirate representative Carlos Garcia in its second in place of Duncan. Garcia hits seventh. Hill hits in the number one spot with Greg Jeffries out of the game. And Bagwell remains ninth. He had pinched it for Maddox. Hit toward Bagwell. He backhands. Hill covers one out. You will see a different pitcher from Maddox in, in Hill. He will bust the fastball First in on the hitters and throw a split Thomas. finger or fork ball out over the plate. He pitches the fastball in and the off speed stuff out over the plate. Let's head now for the National League dugout. Say hello to Johnny Bench for the first time tonight. JB. All right, Bob. Thank you very much, Greg. You're pitching World Series All Star games. Uh, one will make you a little more nervous than the other. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I was pretty nervous out there tonight. After the first inning, things went a lot better for me. I settled down. I felt like. What about your first All Star appearance? Wow, that was I was a wreck then. I can't even remember. I can't remember anything about it. I was so nervous out there. But this one, a lot more enjoyable. Team's got the lead. Back up to you, Bob. All right, Johnny. Two and zero to Frank Thomas. And he has Ken Hill Joe where he has so many American League pitchers on a daily basis behind in the count. Three and oh. Well the one thing about Hill he will challenge you. Two and oh. But as you said Thomas will not swing at anything out of the strike zone. And he walks on four pitches. As he trots down to first, consider he leads the league in average at 383 in runs, in walks, in on base percentage, total bases, and slugging, and he's very close to the lead in home runs and RBIs. I mean, these are the kinds of figures that most people watching tonight weren't alive to see anybody put up. These are Jimmy Fox numbers, Ted Williams numbers in the 40s and early 50s, they're Babe Ruth numbers. Only two hitters have ever topped 500 and on base and 700 and slugging in the same year. Ruth and Williams. Carter swings at the first one. Justice in right field. Easy play. Well, you know when you talk to this guy too, Bob, and, and about the walks and not swinging at pitches that are pretty close to the strike zone. I mean, he tells you he's going to stay disciplined the way he is. He'd rather take the walk, but... On the other hand, when you've got runners aboard, you got a guy at second, a guy at third, where a long fly ball might get him in. I mean, 383 is outstanding. It's great. Slugging percentage, 795, 515 on base. But uh, uh, there's a lot of arguments about that. If you can reach a ball, guys like him, the big RBI guys, if you can reach a ball, they go for it. Here's a completely different sort of hitter, Kirby Puckett. You got to try <laughs> to walk Kirby, and he attributes that free swinging style to playing stickball in Chicago as a kid the box on the brick wall was painted with a huge strike zone and he's a little guy at least in terms of height had to flail away. I always like Dick Allen's theory on hitting he was here yesterday for the upper deck heroes game. Dick Allen always said if he could reach a ball he thought it was a strike. <laughs> Ninth all star game in a row for Kirby. Short lead by Thomas at first base and a called strike. Joe, you were that kind of a hitter. I had to be patient though, Bob. <laughs> I couldn't go out of the strike zone. If I went out of the strike zone, it was an out. I wasn't strong as Frank Thomas and some of the big hitters. And Puckett fouls it off. I mean, you look at this guy, Frank Thomas, and I do not want to overstate it. Just look at the physique on the guy. He was a tight end at Auburn, football teammate of Bo Jackson. The word awesome is overused. <laughs> what other word would you use about this guy? He's just eye popping. The 2 2 pitch. And Puckett squibs it down to Bagwell. And that finishes the American League in the top of the fourth. 
Frank Thomas and company trail it four to one. The 1994 All-Star Game is brought to you by Buick and your local Buick dealers. Remember Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. By North, a new film from Castle Rock Entertainment and Columbia Pictures at theaters July 22nd. And by Concert, the new global communications company formed by British Telecommunications and MCI. Jim Fragosi trying to work everybody in. Marquise Grissom of the Expos, an actual center fielder, is there now. David Justice of the Braves is out of the game. Tony Gwynn moves to his more comfortable position. He's in right. Bonds remains in left. Grissom hits in Justice's spot. Ken Hill works to Cal Ripken, and there's a strike to start the top of the fifth with the National League leading 4-1. Ripken grounded a second his first time up. And that'll make the seats. You know, earlier, Bob, you were talking about uh, Denny McLean. Somebody hit a ball and we got interrupted. You had a Denny McLean story you're going to tell. I'm not sure know. it's worth it three <laughs> innings later, but we might as well dot all the I's and cross all the T's after this next pitch to Ripken. Fastball high one and two. So McLean noted free spirit. Due to start the 69 All-Star Game coming off the 30 win year the year before he would win consecutive Cy Young Awards the game is rained out in on Ripken's fists and he muscles it down the left field line with Bonds in pursuit and right near the chalk Barry Bonds makes a nice running catch so McLean is due to start the game gets rained out he flies home to Detroit to keep a dental appointment the next day. Blows the start, and Mel Stottlemyre has to go, but he comes back, gets there in the second inning, and comes into the game in the fourth. And the teeth hurt all the worse. They were throbbing when <laughs> Willie McCovey went deep on him right away. <laughs> teeth drilled, and then McCovey did the drilling. Aren't you glad you asked? Oh, yeah, that was a great story. <laughs> Three-inning wait was worth it. Ball one to Rodriguez. Hill has really come into his own, hasn't he, Joe? Yes, he has always had potential, but he now he throws strikes. That's the key. When he was with the Cardinals, he was a little more erratic, and he discovered this split-fingered forkball or whatever he calls it, and now he's become one of the better pitchers in the National League. He has always had the good fastball. Rodriguez spanks one to dead center field. Grissom on the run, back near the track, and he makes the catch. Well, two good plays in the outfield for the National League here in the fifth. Here, well, that, here it is again, Grissom going back on the drive off the bat of Rodriguez. He made it look rather easy. High fastball that Rodriguez got into. You think Gwynn makes that catch, Joe? Well, he may have made that one, but the first ball that was missed by Gwynn, I believe Grissom would have caught because he's a natural center fielder. He caught that one because he'd been playing a lot deeper. <laughs> and the play by Bonds on the hitter before it, those are the two best left fielders and center fielders in the National League right now. Chili Davis now will pinch it for Cohn. Randy Johnson is warming up. He swings on the first one, and he's thrown out. So Hill sets them down in order in the fifth. Nationals cling to a 4-1 lead. Welcome back to Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh for the 65th annual All-Star Game. Hannah Storm along with David Cohn uncharacteristically allowing three runs in the third. What happened out there? Somebody's got to be the GOAT. I guess it's going to be me. I hope we can come back and score some runs so I'm not the story. Well, you got some power on this bench. They might take care of you. One highlight, though, or sure to make all the highlights tonight, Barry Bonds losing his bat on your curveball. When's the last time that happened? I haven't seen that in a while. He's a tough hitter. He's gotten me a few times in the National League. I just got some pitches up, and, and uh, that's a good lineup over there. Everybody's talking about this American League, but that National League's a good lineup also. All right, David, good luck in the second half. Bob? Thanks, Anna. Here's Mike Messina in the game, and Messina is the way he prefers to have it pronounced. All the controversy last year in his home park of Camden Yards. He's warming up in the ninth inning. Cito Gaston doesn't use him. Ahead 9-3, to three and the hometown fans weren't the least bit pleased. And Messina actually nursed a grudge about it for a while, and they've tried to put it behind them now. 
He had warmed up earlier, sat down, then Randy Johnson began throwing, and he's still tossing in the bullpen. So Messina becomes the third American League pitcher. Cito has done a smart thing from the American League bench. His first two pinch hitters have been Molitor and Davis, the two DHs who couldn't play the field hit hard and pass Leland in the third base coach's spot so he got them out of the way early before the strategy shapes up late in the game when you might want to make switches that affect your defense. Now, Molitor as you said Bob used early hit the first pitch I don't think he was in the game more than three minutes. <laughs> this is the Rockies Dante Bichette with an 0 2 count and he pops one softly in the left but Carter was playing deep and he can't get there. So a pinch single for Bichette. I don't know if Carter really saw that ball when it left the bat. It looked like he took a step back, then came on. I don't know if he had a chance to catch it anyway. A little soft fly ball off the bat of Dante Bichette. A little breaking ball or off speed pitch from Messina. And Carter, I said, look, I don't know if he saw that ball immediately or not. They sit though for Dante. Here's Gwen. Jim Fragosi indicated he might play the whole game. Know Tony Gwynn's an amazing hitter. I'll give you another amazing statistic about him, Bob, and that is he uses a 31 inch bat. Mm -hmm. It's like a little league bat, even for me. <laughs> what size did you use? 34 and a half, 32 ounce. He uses a 31 inch, 30 ounce bat, sometimes 29 ounces. Gwynn is 34 years old, thinking man's hitter, disciplined, focused, constantly watching the videotape. You know, if he's not leading the league every year, up amongst the leaders, right at the top, you think something's wrong with him. Tries to go the opposite way. Carter closing ground on it, and Joe is able to get to this one. Bichette retreating to first base. Well, last year, Gwynn hit 358 and didn't win his fifth batting title because Andres Galarraga came out of nowhere to hit 370. And they haven't warmed up any to Barry Bonds here. Bonds a sack fly that drove Puckett to the wall and right in the first and looked bad fanning against Cone in the third. Messina works to him. There's a strike. You go back a ways with the plate umpire Paul Rungi don't you Joe. <laughs> yeah Paul Rungi and I were teammates on the Durham Bulls in 1963. Of course that was before Susan Sarandon came by we didn't get a chance to meet her <laughs> but we were teammates. Ball and a strike to Barry. The shed at first. One down, bottom of the fifth. 4 1 National League. They have six hits. The Americans have three. The Americans have won the last six straight All Star games. In there. Hey Joe, here's a guy that hits baseballs out of sight from time to time. Bonafide home run hitter. It's always amazed me. Not, not so much amazing. I mean, it, it shows you you don't have to be the big guy and you don't have to hold a bat down on the knob or have the knob up in your hand. To hit, to hit home runs. How much hitting surface do you think he has? You talked about Gwynn's bat. How much hitting surface do you think he's got from his hands to the barrel? Well, you're right. He probably has about 30 inches as well. He chokes up, as you can see, about an inch and a half. But the, maybe the greatest hitter who ever lived, Ted Williams, also choked up. He had over 500 in home runs, 521. Again on one and two. He's a strikeout victim for the second time in three at bats. You know, Barnes admitted first to Roy Firestone on ESPN, then to us yesterday, that early in his career, he didn't handle the press the way he should have. He came across as more sure of himself than perhaps he wanted. He said, I should have kept my mouth shut, and he alienated some people here in Pittsburgh. On the other hand, he played magnificent baseball here for three division winners. And he should be appreciated as one of the great players in the game. Here is Piazza. Yeah, it he, takes a big guy to admit that too, Bob. And, and yesterday in talking with him, I mean, there's cases where these guys come to the big leagues at 19 and 20 and 21 years old, 
and and it, it is a problem for them. I mean, they're free spirits, uh, not that much responsibility-wise, and, and you're making a lot of money, and and you really don't have to do a lot of things once you're here and you're established a couple of years and established the way he has established himself. It does become a problem because you're 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 bugged by the media all the time. They want you constantly, and if you don't do things uh, from time to time, you get a bad rap. No one's ever won four MVP awards. Bond still has time. The 0-2 pitch to Piazza and he fouls it off. Messina, 13 and 4, ERA just under three. He's got a shot at the Cy Young along with Jimmy Key. The National League starter Greg Maddox could be the first man ever to win three in a row. But he'll have competition from Ken Hill and some others. David Cohn might have Cy Young numbers in the American League. That's high. Cohn gave up three runs, but he also struck out three in two innings of work. That slider was biting most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. He got a couple of breaking balls up that hurt him. Tried to wait on the off-speed pitch. Wide of first, Frank Thomas to tuck it away. So we've gone through five. It's still 4-1 National League. Top of the order in the top of the sixth for the American League and a new pitcher, Doug Drabeck. Bad first year after he went to Houston. He's turned it around this time. Terrific stretch here for the Pirates. Won the Cy Young Award in 1990, and yet this is his first All-Star appearance. Alomar 0 for 2. You know, it's not all that uncommon. Tonight's starter, Greg Maddox, Cy Young Award last year, just 8-8 eight eight at the break. Didn't make the All-Star team. There have been 17 Cy Young Award winners and seven MVPs who did not participate in the All-Star game that year. Line through the box, a base hit for Alomar. Trebek is an off-speed type of pit hit pitcher. He'll throw a lot of breaking balls, curve balls, sliders, and chains. But he will throw the fastball to get the sinking fastball to get the double play. This is a breaking ball that hangs right in the middle of the plate. Good hitting there by Alomar. He didn't try to pull it, just lined it right back through the middle. So the American League trying to get something shaking here in the sixth. Boggs has singled and struck out. He's shown some pop this year, nine home runs. That's already his second highest total. He had 24 in the lively ball year of 1987, which stands out as a real aberration in his long career. This is not a lively ball year? <laughs> well, I guess it is. <laughs> you believe it's juice, huh? Yes, I do. Ah, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't you like to grab a bat, that juice ball this year? Uh, no, nah, I'm, nah, I'm, uh, I'm happy where I am. Alomar bluffs a go, and Boggs takes a strike. Talk about Drabeck. Not making the all-star team in a Cy Young year. And some players complain the rosters are limited. Put it in perspective. Hank Greenberg was the unanimous MVP in 1935. And at the break, he had 103 RBIs. Alomar running. And Boggs fouls it off. 25 homers, 103 RBIs. And the teams were selected by the managers. And the manager was his own player manager and teammate, Mickey Cochran of the Tigers. And he leaves Greenberg off the team. So if Bip Roberts complains or John Franco complains, hey, others have had it worse. Maybe a personality a conflict. Huh? <laughs> Salary conflict for sure. On the outside corner, and you're looking at a rarity. A double strikeout game for Wade Boggs. Here it is, a fastball that is uh, around the outside corner. A little Taylor from Drabeck. I don't know if that was a strike or not, but Boggs doesn't take too many like that. Here it is again. Another look. Off the outside corner. That's a bad, that's a bad call. <laughs> you know what? You tend to believe that with, a, with an eye like Boggs, when he strikes out looking, you tend to believe it might have been a missed call. <laughs> Don't pitchers love those pitches? All right, here's Junior. Doubled and grounded to first. It's one of those pitches where Piazza turns around to the umpire and says, a lot of guys wouldn't call that. <laughs> Tough pitch to call, but you called it right. Alomar. On at first.
first as Griffey fouls one off. All the talk about the pursuit of Roger Maris. Obviously, if there's a strike, there's no chance. But even if they play 162, the odds are overwhelmingly against Griffey, against Thomas, against Williams. If no one breaks it this year, Maris's record will have stood exactly as long as Ruth stood the year Maris broke it. 34 years. And really, no one has come close. Ruth's record was challenged more often. Fox at 58, Greenberg at 58, Wilson at 56, Mays and Mantle made runs. No one has hit more than 52 since Maris hit the 61. A ball and a strike. There goes Alomar. A swing and a miss and a high fastball. The throw is not in time. Stolen base for Robbie. But Robbie had a pretty good jump, not a great jump. Piazza had a shot at him, but he did not make a good throw. And watch, not a perfect jump there. And you'll see the ball coming to the pitcher. Not a good throw. It hit the turf and bounced. Good play there by Ozzy. Alomar dived to the outside of the bag, makes the tag a lot longer from Ozzy's standpoint. <laughs> they kind of eye each other. Even a good throw, Joe, if he's on the other side of the bag, if he's on the right field side of the bag, close, but I still think Alomar's in there. Here's a pitcher's nightmare, man in scoring position, and Griffey and then Thomas with a crack to knock him home. Two and two. You talk about a guy being ahead, whoever the guy is, this year or in the past, ahead of Maris's pace, ahead of Ruth's pace. Misleading. Maris's biggest months were July and August. Ruth hit 17 home runs in September of 1927. Lots of guys have been ahead of the pace and then tailed off. I even think I was ahead one time, Bob, after about three games. <laughs> <laughs> big week, huh? Yeah, big week. <laughs> Joe, when you look at uh, when you look at Griffey and playing in a couple of indoor stadiums, and and in difference to in those years of, of the Marises and. He hits it sharply into center. It'll drop in front of Grissom for a hit. They're waving Alomar home. The throw is cut off, and now they've got Griffey hung up. Bagwell cut it off, and Ozzie puts the tag on him. Well, good hitting, but not good base running there by Griff. They really didn't have a good shot to get Alomar at the plate. He was going to score, and if Griffey could have stayed at first base, he would have been the, you know, Frank Thomas would have been the tying first run. They're waving Alomar around. He's going to make it easy. Watch the throw is smartly cut off by Bagwell, and they take Griffey at second base. But what a wonderful hitter. Look at this. I mean, it's just a natural swing. Nothing forced when Ken Griffey's in the batter's box. So Griff is now two for three. He gets the RBI, but runs into the second out. And Thomas bats with the bases empty, and he whistles one into center for a hit. Well, you know that's going to happen <laughs> after the guy makes a base running mistake. Going back, just just to finish the thought on on, on Griffey and Maris and, and uh, playing indoors, Bob. Later in the season, I mean, it's cool all the time. You don't have the July and August where you're outside and burning heat or standing out there in the outfield, standing on the artificially surfaced fields and standing outside, which I mean, probably played a big part. Maris in New York, of course, you're not getting the coverage. Uh, the Griffey heat. I'm sure it's going to be heat for him, or Thomas, or Williams, or whomever. Carter. The broken thumb late in spring training played right through it before we put this subject to bed again perspective on how tough it is to challenge Maris's record there are 14 players with more than 500 home runs outside corner for a strike 10 of them never hit as many as 50 in a season let alone challenge 60 the all time leader Hank Aaron never hit 50 only Ruth Mays Madeline Fox among the 14 500 home run hitters ever topped 50. Strike two. Thomas is two for two with a walk. Carter lined into a double play, fly to right. A run home in the sixth. He lays off two and two. It on deck. What a show he put on yesterday. I mean, he sent some rockets into the upper deck in right, and Frank Thomas did the same in left. There were three or four that were estimated beyond 500 feet. 
Thomas had the big one. They said at 525. He hit one 519 and then followed that one into the upper deck or off the facing of the upper deck in deep left center at 525. There it is. He hit the Will Clock sign, didn't he? Boy, that's a long way. <clears throat> Here's a look at it. <laughs> man, it sounded like a cannon blast. <laughs> oh, man. Back live, and Carter hangs with it, punching it out of play. And you might add, it's tougher to hit a ball that far in batting practice than it is during the game because you have to supply all the power. Yep. Batting practice pitchers throwing approximately 60 miles an hour. Of course, you got a pretty good idea where it's going to be. Well, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ain't going to much of a break to it. Thomas inches away from first. The 2 2 pitch with two out. Bounce toward Williams. He backs up, goes the short way, and throws it away. Thomas bounces back up. The ball loose down the line. Thomas being waved home. The throw is going to go to third. A run scores, and everybody's safe. As Joe Carter winds up at third base. Well, very uncharacteristic of Matt Williams overthrowing Garcia on the attempted force that would have ended the inning. A little bouncer hit by Joe Carter that Williams backs up on. Here's the underhand flip or the sidearm flip and he just threw the ball away. Garcia never had a chance. Easy play just threw it away. As you said Bob you don't see him make that play. I mean that's that's an easy play. Oh boy. Well a three base throwing error. An unearned run home. A one run game all of a sudden and obviously Anything they get the rest of the inning is unearned. A hit for Puckett could tie it. Back through the middle to his left. Ozzy, no chance. The game tied. And it's a tough out at the plate anyway, and Kirby Puckett and you put runners on base, and he drives them in. But as you mentioned, Matt Williams does not make many throwing errors. So now Fregosi to the mound. And it's not Drabeck's fault, but they'll call on his Astro teammate, John Hudak. Three runs across, even at four on the sixth. We'll be back. Johnny Bench played some third base late in his career. Johnny, you take this. He retired <laughs> by playing third base, but here's Garcia at a very late pace coming down to second base. I know Williams had a little bit of a high throw, but Garcia awfully late getting there unless he anticipated the throw to first base. From the second baseman's perspective, Joe. I agree with John. He should have been there sooner, and I think he could have jumped straight up and maybe have caught the ball. Can't defend Matt Williams as a high throw, but there he could have helped his teammate out. In comes the only rookie in the game, John Hudek, and he does throw hard. Ripken couldn't catch up with it. He is the first guy in All-Star history to appear in an All-Star game before he wins his first big league game. <laughs> Obviously, the saves are the important stat, and the ERA under two, and nearly a strikeout an inning. But he was knocking around. He's 27 years old, released by the Tigers. Astros pick him up. Mitch Williams falters. Boom, here he is, closer. Ball strike 0 and 2. I guess that begs to ask the question how could the Tigers release a pitcher? Mm -hmm. <laughs> One that makes it in the All Star game. <laughs> you know, talking with this guy yesterday, Joe, and, and about his philosophy with pitching, he said, I just go right at him. He said, Here it is. If you can get it, go. The 0 2 to Ripken. Foul back. That's got to be the slow gun. I know he's a little better than 80. What did that say, 81? 94? Okay. I think That's a little more like it. I think the 81 was <laughs> Piazza throwing it back. <laughs> Either that or it doubles as a thermometer. <laughs> 94 miles an hour. Ripkins 0 for 2. MVP of the 91 All Star game in Toronto. Two time league MVP. The 0 2 pitch to him. Struck him out. Kudek performs his specialty, but three runs across, two of them unearned. Brand new game.
The 1994 All-Star Game is brought to you by Toyota and their full line of quality cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. By True Lies, the new action adventure starring Arnold Schwarzenegger starts Friday at theaters everywhere. And by Budweiser, Beachwood Age for a crisp, clean, classic taste. Scorecard sales are brisk at the All-Star Game. They're a souvenir, but you also need them to keep track. Only Ripken and Rodriguez remain. You got a new pitcher, Randy Johnson, a whole new outfield. Albert Bell and Kenny Lofton from the Indians in. Ruben Sierra, the lone Oakland A on the team. Will Clark replaces Frank Thomas at first. Chuck Knobloch is in for Alomar at second. Cooper of the Red Sox at third for the man who preceded him at that position in Boston, Wade Boggs, and Rodriguez remains as the catcher. Tied at four, Randy Johnson. Who will ever forget what he did to John Cruck last year in Baltimore? John Cruck. <laughs> oh, well, he'd like to forget it. <laughs> John Cruck, not here, but uh, his lookalike sang the national anthem. Meatloaf told me before the game, I'm here because John Cruck isn't. <laughs> a ball Randy, strike. You see Randy Johnson gets it up there in a hurry as well. 93 miles an hour in that fastball. He will go to triple digits on a good night. He'll get to 100. I wouldn't mind seeing 100 from this distance. <laughs> Two balls and a strike to Matt Williams. And a high pop and a shallow right. Ruben Sierra is there. Joe, let's talk about this from an intimidation standpoint. The guy is 6'10. He has the long stride. You were a left handed hitter. Here's Cruck last year. Well, Randy Johnson, of course. He doesn't have a smooth motion, first of all, so he's very intimidating. You can't pick the ball up quickly enough. <laughs> was that on purpose? I would hope not. <laughs> I don't think it was. No, really he throws don't. too hard for that. Well, Cruck waved the white flag <laughs> and took the K and quickly took his leave. Here's Marquise Grissom, who's in center field at this point. When you talk about intimidation, though, Bob, I'll give you an example. Now we'll take a look at his motion and this motion can intimidate you because it's unorthodox. Sandy Koufax threw harder but he was more comfortable. He was straight over the top. He didn't really intimidate you too much. He just threw the ball right by you. you know, guys Johnson too Joe I was just going to say Johnson too one of those guys that normally left handers have that ball that really runs. I mean this guy throwing in the high 90s with a running fastball tailing away. He doesn't have that though. Fastball basically straight. He'll throw a cutter once in a while. That little breaking ball right there. Two and two to Grissom. Did guys throw at you, Uke? Yeah, I was uh, no different than anybody else. Guys threw at me a lot. Unfortunately, they were outfielders. I was in the bullpen. You <laughs> <laughs> still get thrown at. <laughs> if that's his off-speed stuff, it's around 80 miles an hour, 79. There's a fastball. They used to talk about the average of the average fastball, a guy with average stuff, 87, 86 to 87 miles an hour. So when you're up in the 90s, like this guy is in Hudik. Although Joe, you know you got to have you got to have something else. That's true, especially if your fastball is straight. This ball is sliced down the line and right and gets out of the yard. Marquise Grissom goes the opposite way, and the National League takes the lead again. At 5-4. Well, when he first swung, I thought the ball was going foul, first of all. And I didn't think it would definitely would not carry all the way into the lower deck. Well, you put all the factors 
together. Maybe a lively ball. Guys swinging lighter bats with greater bat speed, and Johnson providing a lot of the velocity himself. You go the opposite way, make any kind of contact, it carries, and the ball is carrying tonight at Three Rivers. I didn't think that ball had any chance to go. As Joe said, I thought it was going foul. Nice, easy swing by Grissom. Fastball again in the 90s, and he thought it was going foul, too. Carlos Garcia hits one hard into center field for a clean single. And they appreciate that at Three Rivers. Remember, this is a franchise which had Drayback and Bonilla and Bonds and lost them all because they couldn't compete financially. If there were a poster child for revenue sharing and salary caps, the kid would be wearing a pirate hat. Standing with a new first baseman, Will Clark of the American League. This is a real sign of respect by Jim Fragosi that Ozzie Smith, hitting just 240 at age 39, goes this long in this All Star game. And if anybody deserves what might be a final national showcase, it's Ozzie Smith. But I also think Jim Fragosi can identify with Ozzie Smith very well in that he was a shortstop, and as he got up in age, he knew that he had to move to another position or out of the game. So I think he has a lot of respect for Ozzie, as you said. There goes the runner, and Ozzie fouls it off. You know, Joe, no matter how hard to get back to that thought a moment ago about Johnson and his 90 plus mile an hour fastball, if you don't have the breaking stuff, a little off speed stuff to go with it, it's almost like batting practice. I don't care how hard you throw, I don't care if you throw 100. If you're sitting hard stuff all the time and if you go up against a guy like this you be, if you look anything but hard stuff against him you ought to go someplace else and play right. Ozzie a switch hitter of course from the right side the one two pitch from Johnson hit hard down the line and left and that ball. What a story that would have been for Ozzy Smith, who only recently crept past your lifetime home run total, you to go deep in the All-Star <laughs> game off Randy Johnson. I want to tell you something. Something's wrong here. There's that ball. Just foul. Just foul. And he looked like he had a breaking ball, a slider off of Johnson. There it is. I mean, right on it. Mm. And just missed. Look at the odds. Stay up, baby. Stay fair, baby. <laughs> Stay fair, baby. He, he doesn't have the good <laughs> talking to it like Carlton Fisk had. <laughs> Carlton Fisk will keep it fair for him. Boy, oh, that how hard. sweet would that have been? Oh, huh? man. We're in the sixth. 5 4 National League. Got him leaning, and they punch him out. Garcia says no. But John Shulock of the American League says, you bet. Well, he definitely caught him leaning towards second base. It's a question of whether the throw gets there in time and the tag is applied. Garcia dies back. Clark grabs it. And they almost said, have to huh? agree with Garcia yeah. there. Well, the throw beat him, but maybe the yeah. tag didn't. No, the tag didn't beat him, but the throw definitely beat him. We'll get a better look at it from this angle. Now watch when his hand hits the bag. Yeah. And the fans see that on the replay. <laughs> And now the count goes full to Ozzie. Johnson, by the way, is by far the leader in pickoffs in the American League. He's got eight in the first half of the season. Here's the 3 2. Broken bat roll at a third. And across the diamond, Cooper of the Red Sox to Clark of the Rangers. National League goes in front. We're back after this from your local station. Here's tonight's Toyota Diamond Dust baseball fact. 136 homers in all-star history. Can you guess the oldest and youngest players to hit one out in the all-star game? We'll give you the answer in the next half inning, and we'll give you a couple of changes for the National League defensively in just a moment. We go to the top of the seventh. Yvonne Rodriguez to start it against Hudek who ended the last inning by fanning Cal Ripken Jr. Rodriguez is 0 for 2. 
Robbed of a hit his last time up on a nice running catch in center by Marquise Grissom. Fastball pop back. New second baseman. Craig Biggio of the Astros. And another Astro makes his first appearance. Ken Caminiti. Caminiti, an eight-year player. This is his first appearance in an All-Star game. So a big night for him, replacing Matt Williams at third. Two. Ozzie remains at shortstop, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if Fragosi, in tribute to him, this will certainly be the last All Star game he ever plays in a National League park. If he plays one more year, announces his retirement, and they add him to the team next year, the game will be in Texas. He might let him go all the way. Mm -hmm. As he said with Gwynn, Gwynn will play the full nine, and maybe the same holds true for us. Rodriguez sends one up the middle for a hit. So that's the way the top of the seventh starts. The American League has one backup catcher. It's Mickey Tettleton. Now there is a rule in the All-Star game that pertains to catchers only. If the second catcher comes in and is subsequently hurt, you can reinsert the starting catcher. And that's the only catcher you have. Yeah. And here's Tettleton now batting for the pitcher. So Tettleton bats for Johnson. Knobloch is on deck. And the switch hitter fouls the first one back. He's topped 30 home runs each of the last three years for Detroit. He's got 14 this year. We are talking earlier, Joe, about Barry Bonds and the way he chokes. Take a look at yeah. Tettleton. <laughs> He's got the bat handle, the knob, in about the middle of his hand. Look how low he carries this thing, and then the whip action to get it up and going again. Well, they call that one finger buried. There have been a couple of players with two fingers buried. That's one finger underneath the knob. Willie Stargell used to get two fingers underneath it. Hank he Aaron. Be awfully strong mm -hmm. to do that. The one-one pitch. Look at the way Tettleton holds the bat in a way reminiscent of West Covington except Covington used to hold it higher but also almost parallel to the ground Tettleton's got it at about belt level but held loosely and almost flat behind it well you always got to get it started from some place he gets it started I mean he gets it started when the pitch is on the way maybe you better start it a little soon a little quicker on this guy <laughs> yeah who, who that do, does not give you a lot of time to start it here it is again on Tettleton, that fastball. Mickey with the bat back. He gets back up on top, but the ball by him. Joe, everybody talks about the hitting theories of where you should carry the bat and, and how you should stride, what you should do. More often than not, it's whatever is comfortable for you. Let her go. Just have to get it into hitting position before the ball gets there. Rodriguez at first, nobody out, and this is a 3-2 pitch to Tettleton, and the runner goes. And that's ball four. So the American League, trailing 5-4, has something going. Chuck Knobloch steps in. His dad, Ray, suffered a mild heart attack, his old high school baseball coach, a guy who played minor league ball. And here's what Chuck says about dedicating tonight's performance to him. Yeah, he was my high school coach, and uh, he played ball himself, and uh, he was in San Diego, and he was hoping desperately to be here tonight, and, uh, you know, he had a uh, mild heart attack, and, and uh, I just want to say get well and, and uh, get better quick. There you see the batting glove. He flashed it during the introductions prior to the game, so his dad is watching from his hospital bed. He was there in person two years ago at the All-Star Game in San Diego. Knobloch hits one toward the hole. Ozzy! A definitive moment from the definitive shortstop of his generation and maybe in the history of the game. 13 gold gloves. Well, I'm sure Bob Euchre has not seen this play very often. I've seen it quite often, <laughs> Bob. It becomes almost routine the way Ozzie makes it, but no one else in baseball could make that play except Ozzie Smith. 
And now Fragosi heads to the mound. Well, you can look at it now from the outfield. I mean, <laughs> you know, when Ripken talked earlier about how big and cumbersome he was that he had to play the hitters, not this guy. Fragosi discussing with Hudek the merits of a shower at this juncture, and we'll take a break. Aerial shots of Three Rivers Stadium and the surrounding Pittsburgh area provided by MetLife Blimp Snoopy One. MetLife's aerial ambassador typically cruises at an altitude of 1,200 feet and a speed of 35 miles per hour looking to do battle with the dreaded Red Baron. Let's answer the trivia question while Danny Jackson warms up. He's come out of the bullpen for the National League. The oldest to connect in all-star play, Stan Musial. Now, it would have been interesting if Ozzie's ball had stayed fair, we would have had to start counting months and days because Ozzie is 39, turns 40 in December. Musial hit more all-star homers than anybody, six in his story career, and the youngest, Johnny Bench, in the 1969 game at RFK Stadium in Washington when the Senators still had a franchise. Let's go quickly to Johnny Bench. Remember that all-star homer? I know you do. Well, I sure do. It was the year you were talking about 1969 when Denny McLean got to the dental appointment and Stottlemyre started and the first pitch I saw he hit for home run and later Yastrzemski took the second one over the fence away from me. Up steps Scott Cooper. Danny Jackson, the left-hander, on to face him. With one out, the American League has the tying run at third base. Rodriguez opened the inning with a single. Tettled and walked, and then Knobloch's bid for a base hit was snuffed out by Ozzie Smith. They got the force at second, so runners at the corners with one out. Cooper's first at bat of this game. And this will get the run home and maybe more deep in the left field. And Bonds watches it hit off the wall for extra bases. In comes Rodriguez, an opposite field double for Cooper with Knobloch pulling up a third. Hey, this is a good game. Very good game. Cooper takes this fastball. It was inside, not exactly where Danny Jackson wanted to throw it. Bonds makes a good play. Bare hands it, gets it back in. And that keeps Knobloch from scoring. Here's a tag up there by Rodriguez. He scores easily. Still only one out, and they're going to pull the infield in against Kenny Lofton of the Central Division leading Cleveland Indians. He really has supplanted Ricky Henderson as the premier leadoff man in the American League. He's at 378. He's got pop, 10 home runs, 45 steals, leads the majors. Terrific butter on a pace for almost 250 hits. Swing and a miss. I think this is an interesting situation here. They're playing the infield all the way in with runners at second and third. And Any, especially on the carpet, Joe. Right. Anything hit by this guy can really fly, as Bob said. But usually in a tie ball game, play back yeah. and give up the run. You're on the, only in the seventh inning. One and one. Lofton hangs in well against lefties, hitting 350. Yeah, he's not bad. I'll tell you, this guy can play. Unbelievable center field. He's one of those guys that can climb the wall. He throws well. <clears throat> On the inside corner, one and two. Danny Jackson was the number four starter last year for Jim Fergosi's pennant winners, but now with injuries, Schilling hurt, Green hurt, Mulholland gone, Ben Rivera hurt. He's really the ace of the Philly staff at this point. Where the DL is crowded. In Philadelphia. The one two pitch to Lofton lays off. Will Clark on deck, and then if the inning keeps going, Albert Bell. Knoblock at third, Cooper at second with one out. If you're Danny Jackson in this situation, you need a strikeout. 
And that fastball up and in there, that was what he wanted to get a, get the strikeout with. Joe, they play, they play loft and they hit the other way, but I tell you, this guy, this guy can pull. He can pull. He's strong. He can hit to right center. Bob said earlier he can bunt, but I, I can tell you he can pull. Another 2-2 pitch. Hit toward the hole, and with the infield in, they have no chance. One run scores. Cooper waved home. Bonds has no play. And the American League has scored three times in the seventh, and they lead seven to five. Well, that's the danger you run when you bring the infield in. The infielders have no range at all. The ball goes through there so quickly. This ball goes through before they can move. I mean, if you're back, you have a chance to keep this ball on the infield, if not make a play. You may not be able to throw loft now, but you could keep the ball on the infield. Nice piece of hitting by Lofton. A little breaking ball from Jackson out away. Took it to left field. Bonds the charge, but no play. And the Americans back on top, Bob, 7-5. Fregosi makes the logical move with the lefties do. He brings in Jackson, but two straight hits by left-handed hitters, Cooper and Lofton. Here's another one, Clark. Swing and a miss, and we might see Lofton run, testing Piazza's arm. Kind of all-star game you like to see. Plenty of action. Not going. And a ball. Lofton down at first. Terrific basketball player. Sixth man on Lute Olson's Arizona team that went to the Final Four in 1988. Graduated from Arizona with a degree in television. Wrote his thesis, as I understand, on Mr. Belvedere, Uke. <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> Why wouldn't you get an A on that? <laughs> down the line and left. Bonds toward the bullpen and out of play. <laughs> And here's a look at the 1994 Chevrolet MVP award. That's the all star MVP trophy which will be presented immediately following the game. A few candidates have emerged but the game still very much in doubt 7 5 American League. The pitch to Clark line drive over Ozzie for a hit. Lofton will stop at second. Tell you what, Bob, this game is mirror imaging most games you see in the major leagues this year. A lot of offense. Well, Fregosi's move with the left hander. Here's Clark again, a pitch out away from him. And he drills it to center field. And now Jim Fregosi is coming out again. Look at Clark. Joe, you've watched this guy for so long. And I mean, you talk about somebody who uses the whole ballpark. Balls away, he'll go the other way. He's got power, although his powers, power totals are down this year, but a, a pure hitter, Will Clark. Batting 353 in his first year in the American League. Ozzie is now coming out of the game, so we missed our guess. This is the moment. They have to make a move and a double switch. Will Cordero replaces him at short. Rod Beck of the Giants comes out of the bullpen. Jackson yielded hits to three straight lefties. He's out, so is Ozzy, and we step aside for a minute. Rod Beck of the Giants in. Late addition to the All-Star squad when Jose Rio of the Reds was scratched. Rio and Larkin both hurt. The Reds technically don't have a representative here, although two were named. First at bat for Albert Bell. Look at his eyes, Joe. <laughs> Just stares a hole through the pitcher. <laughs> and Rod Beck does the same thing. So we've got a staring match here. And that's why it's taking so yep. long. You're right. They wanted to see who would back off first. Beck, Look as you Beck. see, kind of fearsome looking himself. And he says he's had the mustache since the 11th grade. <laughs> There goes Lofton, double steal. Piazza can't find the ball. And Lofton steals third, the major league leader in swipes. And Clark steals second behind him. Not an easy ball for Piazza to handle. I don't know if he'd had a chance anyway, Joe, if he makes the catch clean. Little breaking ball down low and away that he let get by. Lofton a major jump, though. He had a huge jump. Will Clark at second. There it is. A little breaking ball down and away that Piazza didn't handle cleanly. And again, I don't know if he has a shot or not. Well, they're back in the same situation. The infield in mm -hmm. again. You know, it's bad enough you got to play against guys like this on artificial surface. Right. Play it up close <laughs> with guys like Bell. Guys who hit the ball so hard. Pitch from Beck. 
Cordero will come to the plate. And they've got Lofton with Piazza applying the tag. So that time it worked. Well, playing the infield in. You have to play the infield in now because there were two runs down in the seventh inning. Before it was a tie ball game. Now when you're two runs down, you cannot afford to let any more runs score. Cordero makes a good play, good throw, high throw, keeps it up, and Piazza applies the tag. There have been four hits, one of them a double, and a walk in this inning. A double steal, and it would have been worse had not Ozzy Smith turned in a brilliant play at shortstop. Here is Sierra, former Ranger now with Oakland. Bounced foul. He is the first product of the Roberto Clemente Sports City in Puerto Rico. Roberto's dream to make it not just to the big leagues, but to an all-star game. His Oakland A's are nine under 500, but only three back of Texas. In the West, the Rangers lead the West three under 500. Could be the first race ever where in September they talk about how many games back a team is in the win column instead of the loss column. Here you see the number 21 worn by Sierra in honor of Roberto Clemente and a pop up back of second base and Biggio of the Astros squeezes it but back to back three run innings for the American League and they're up again 7-5. Back at Three Rivers Stadium for this All-Star game. We're in the bottom of the seventh. American League leading 7-5 to five with Ozzie Smith. And Ozzie, it was vintage in the last inning. And it's an emotional time for you playing in this All-Star game. It is, uh, Johnny, because this uh, very well could be my last one as, uh, as, as far as the National League is concerned. Uh, I plan on playing one more year. And um, I was kind of surprised to be here this year in that I didn't get voted in last year. And usually when you don't get uh, voted in and you've been there 10 or 12 times, it's tough to get back. But uh, I'd like to take the time to thank all the fans that took the time to, to punch my name on the ballot. Well, 2,500 hits in reach and also a home, almost a home run tonight. I came real close. I was a, a tad quick. You know, when, you, when you're facing guys that you haven't faced, uh, it's tough to know exactly what they're going to throw you. And in that particular instance, it's hard to really stay, that, stay back too long on Randy Johnson because he gets the ball up there so well. But he threw me a breaking ball, and I was just uh, out in front a little bit. On behalf of everybody, thanks for being what you are. Thank you, John. Back up to you, Bob. All right, Johnny, and here it is. What might be the final exit in terms of all-star play. And a base hit for Bagwell. This is the 13th all-star game in which Ozzie has appeared. 11 of them as a starter. Says he wants to play one more year. If he stays healthy, he'll get to 2,500 hits. The Hall of Fame long since a foregone conclusion. He is the best defensive shortstop that I have ever seen, and I've seen a lot of good shortstops. He, he's the way they'll be measured from now on, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, was that's such, tough, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's one thing to be good. It's right. another thing to be such a joy to watch, right. which he was. Will Cordero now. Now here's a young shortstop with all the tools but sometimes the concentration lapses obviously he can hit and hit with power uncommon power for a middle infielder but he makes too many errors at this stage of his career. I think it's a lack of concentration in the field. He concentrates in the batter's box but sometimes he takes that out to the field with him and he's not concentrating. I tell you what the ball jumps off of his bat as well as any of the players you've seen in this game tonight. Joe, I'll take, a guy, a, I'll take a guy with these totals and, and take a chance on him defensively anytime, wouldn't you? You'd teach him that defense. Absolutely. Right. Or move him someplace else. <laughs> he can swing the bat like that. He can play the outfield, too. I think he's going to be a quality shortstop. He just has to cut down on his mental lapses. So Cordero takes high. We moved to the bottom of the seventh, and it kind of reminds me of who we were at Wrigley. Harry Carey ordinarily would be serenading yeah. the fans, and we want to send our best wishes Absolutely. to Harry, the voice of the Cubs, in his 50th year in broadcasting. Had some health problems recently, had to interrupt his season, but they expect him back before the end of the month on those broadcasts on WGN. 
actually thought you and Bob were going to go into that <laughs> rendition of take me out to the ball game. I can't sing, so I, I want to stay overnight in Pittsburgh. You know, I was talking to Phil Rizzuto before the game. He is the honorary captain. Did he answer of you? The, Ameri <laughs> <laughs> the American League <laughs> squad. He's going into the Hall of Fame finally. Uh, <laughs> later this month, as a matter of fact, Cordero bounces one to Ripken, who will step on the bag and complete the double play. And you walk in the room, and Scooter says, Hey, <laughs> you guy, I saw that Major League Two. That's right. Saw it on a plane, really liked it. You know, most of us, of course, caught it at the Cannes <laughs> Film Festival, but uh, the That's Scooter right. saw it on the plane. I got a kick out of him. He was, he was sitting in a locker down there. I said, are you being punished? Come out of there. He was sitting, actually sitting inside the locker. I said, look, if you want me to talk to somebody and get you out of there, just ask. Ah, he's a great guy. I love the Scooter. I really do. It's to be around him and, and to listen to him, a pleasure. And uh, well-deserved, finally, in the Baseball's Hall of Fame. You remember a couple of years back, Bob, when he... He had that brace on his arm. He had something wrong with his hand. And we were in Yankee Stadium. He was wearing a brace on his left hand for whatever. And I asked him. I went over on the Yankee broadcast for a couple of minutes. Gwynn with a chopper. And Clark will retire Tony Gwynn, who is now one for four. But that was a bad ball. story anyway. You're going to finish it, whether you <laughs> like it or not. 7-5, American True to form, Cal Ripken doesn't even miss an inning, at least so it appears. He's 0 for 3. You know, he doesn't turn 34 until next month, so 21-31 to pass Gehrig is one thing. He could keep on going for several more years. I think they'll make him rest after he passed Lou Gehrig. Think he'll, he stops the yeah, next I, day? I think day he off. will rest. Day off. Finally get that one day off he's been looking for. And that'll be it. A drive toward the gap in right center field. Gwynn in pursuit back near the fence, and it short hops the wall. Ripken on his way to second, and he's content with a leadoff stand-up double. Well, you know the esteem in which the fans hold him, and in fact, he was second to Ken Griffey Jr. In the overall fan balloting, Ozzie got the most votes in the National League. There's his swing again on a fastball that looked to be out over the plate off the back in the right center field. It's, it short hops the wall out there. Well, I'll tell you, really, as I said at the top of the telecast, the more I watch him and and uh, and appreciate him as a player, and and Joe, I, I know you feel the same way uh, yeah. to have played as long as you did and and to watch this guy day in and day out and not to miss. It's truly remarkable. Rodriguez now as the American League tries to add to a 7-5 lead in the top of the eighth against the Giants' Rod Beck. Beck all but untouchable as the Giants won 103 last year. All-star this year, but the number's off, Joe. Well, he's given up nine home runs in about 30 innings. He has not pitched nearly as well this year as he did last year. Now, he seems to be throwing a lot of fastballs in the middle of the plate, as was evident on the ball that was hit by Ripken. He he is not making the quality pitches that he made last year. And you have to remember, though, he was on a disabled list for quite a while. So injuries, probably the result of that is, is because of the injuries. Robbie Thompson on the DL, Willie McGee, Swift and Burkett, not quite what they were Swift a year ago. Injured too. Yeah, they were. I tell you, they're a completely different club than I saw in Arizona this spring. Here's the 0-2 pitch. Just a bit outside, Duke. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. I was wondering when you were going to get to that one. Just a bit outside. <laughs> Just a bit outside. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> and the one-two pitch. Two and two. We mentioned Phil Rizzuto. Yeah, you know, I wanted to finish that story about Phil. He, I was over there for a little rain delay, and... Uh, and uh, there are the honorary captains. That's Buck Leonard, yep. the old Negro League star. That's yes, the black Lou Gehrig, first baseman for the Homestead Grays. Yes, sir, the Homestead Grays and Phil Rizzuto. And I went over there to sit on a Yankee telecast during a little rain delay. I was with Rizzuto, and he had this little cast or splint or whatever on his wrist. He had a little sprained wrist. And I asked him in the conversation when he started training Falcons. <laughs> and he almost <laughs> answered me. He said, wait a minute. Training Falcons? What do you I said this thing. He said, no, I got a bad wrist. <laughs> He's a beautiful guy, though, Bob. I know you've known him for a long, long time and uh, a, a joy to listen to. 
Uh, I don't know what the Yankee telecast and broadcast would be without Phil Rizzuto. He shows up occasionally now, doesn't he? You mean at the ballpark? Anywhere. Kind of makes yeah. his own schedule. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> two two pitch He's out off. That's Paul O'Neill on deck. A 382 hitter. A point behind Frank Thomas for the American League lead. And sizzling this past week. He was over 400, mm -hmm. fell off down in the 360s, then went on a 13 for 18 tear several days ago. This ball's hit in the air to center field, and Marquise Grissom will make the play. Ripken isn't going anywhere. Grissom is one of 15 kids. Somebody asked him, how come your name is Marquise? He says, my mom ran out of all the regular names, as he put it. She had to go to the French. <laughs> all right, here's O'Neal, who made the All-Star team once as a National Leaguer with the Reds. Wynn and Thomas are tops. But an inordinate number of guys over or around 350. I have a theory. Yes. The theory is there's not as many hard throwers in either league now as there were before. And I think that is contributing to the fact that guys are hitting for a much higher average because they can handle the breaking balls if they don't have to look for the fastball. You know, Joe, talking to Johnny Bench some time ago, there's Jimmy Key and Wade Boggs. Bench was talking about the same thing about the lack of hard throwers yeah. but everybody now seems to want to put movement on the ball pitch on your fists all the time on your knuckles and and do something without the breaking ball breaking ball of course is a mover all the time but make the fastball run in or run away from you cut it or whatever with O'Neill now in the game the only position player according to my calculations who hasn't gotten in for the American League is Travis Fryman of the Tigers a mile high pop up. Cordero records the second out for the National League. We haven't seen Fred McGriff yet. Darren Fletcher the backup catcher. No Moises Salou yet. Jeff Conine of the Marlins hasn't appeared. There's Alou. In terms of pitchers for the American League Jason Bure and Wilson Alvarez of the White Sox haven't been in. Ricky Bonus of the Brewers. Lee Smith, we haven't seen him yet either. Knobloch with 37 doubles might be a threat to the record set by an obscure Red Sox outfielder of the early 30s, Earl Webb. I think Webb got 67 one year. And that's the record. Stood a long time. 0 and 2. Knobloch's 0 for 1, robbed of a hit on Ozzie Smith's diving backhand stop in the seventh inning. 7 5 American League, they've got 12 hits, 5 9 and 1, and the error was costly for the National League. Outside, 1 and 2. National League pitchers we haven't seen Doug Jones, Brett Saberhagen, Randy Myers. Goodbye, Nablon. So Beck concludes the top of the eighth with a strikeout. Still a two-run game, and we'll be back to Three Rivers after this. Snoopy One has teamed up with NBC Sports to bring you these aerial views of the All-Star Game from Three Rivers, the MetLife blimp traveling over 60,000 miles a year. On to the bottom of the eighth we go, 7-5 American League. They wasted a leadoff double by Cal Ripken in the top half. Ripken, as you see, second in the All-Star balloting. Griffey won the popular vote, but I understand Ripken still hopes to prevail in the <laughs> Electoral College. <laughs> Who said they don't care? Another chance for Barry Bonds, a sacrifice fly, and a couple of strikeouts. Wilson Alvarez of the White Sox in. Smooth throwing Venezuelan. Almost looks like he's playing catch out there. He has such an easy motion. At one time, 15 consecutive wins, Bob, going back to last season. Before he was finally beaten a couple of weeks ago. 
The starting catchers have gone all the way. Piazza's in the on deck circle. Rodriguez still in the game for the American League. In the air to left center field, sprinting after it as Kenny Lofton loses his cap, but not the baseball. Great jump there by Kenny Lofton. When the ball was first hit, I thought it was in the gap, but he got a great jump on it, and his speed did the rest. What can he do well? Gold Glover <laughs> throws well, and for a speed guy, a leadoff guy, he hits the ball with authority. He's got power. He took his eye off that ball just momentarily, Joe, to find the warning track, and then made an easy catch. He almost overran the ball. And Piazza, one for three. In there for a strike from Alvarez. Ken Caminiti of the Astros on deck. Grounded to the right side. Coming up with it is Knobloch, and the Minnesota Twin tosses him out. Knobloch, a very fine fielder, had a string of 80 consecutive games without an error dating back to last year and about nine, ten days ago. Sunday night game in Cleveland. Ball went through his legs. Which easy ground ball. Easy ground ball. <laughs> he was probably still nervous over being named to the All-Star team that afternoon. Here's Caminiti, who's got 17 homers. Got under this one too much. And Albert Bell makes it a 1-2-3 last half of the eighth. An inning left at Three Rivers, 7-5 American League. Back after a word from your local stations. Footage from one of his World Series performances. I believe 1971 when he just owned the World Series against the Baltimore Orioles. And there it is, a great Clemente pose. He's breaking for first after just smashing what you imagine is an extra base hit into the gap. He played against him, Joe. In right center field. <laughs> that was his alley. Magnificent hitter and a great player. No matter how many films you see of that guy, Joe, you've always appreciated him more when you had a chance to watch him in person. Exactly. Well, he was something. Randy Myers of the Cubs is in. 17 saves. But the Cubs are not doing well, and here's a guy who could be tasty trade bait. But with the strike looming, and with realignment giving even mediocre teams the idea that they have a chance to stay in the race, I think you will see fewer of the sort of late-season deal that Pat Gillick became a master of mm -hmm. with Toronto, where a contender picks up a veteran guy in return for prospects mm -hmm. late in the year. He's behind Cooper 3 0, and Scott swings at the 3 0 pitch and bounces out to Biggio. Down to the American League dugout, where Hannah Storm holds forth. I'm here with the guy that loves to tout the superiority of the American League. You're close to winning your seventh straight, but you guys usually do it with power. Are you surprised you're getting it done with a lot of singles and doubles? Well, I mean, uh, this is a big ballpark for us. We're not used to it, but uh, you know, we, we got to win, and. Uh, you know, we got to do it some way, and singles and doubles are the key right now. Now, you grew up about an hour from here, Denora, Pennsylvania. You know, you had about 40 family members. Are you happy with the way you're able to perform in front of them? Yeah, I was a little nervous because uh, I've never played, you know, that many family members. Usually it's about 10 or 12, but to have uh, my uncles uh, who've never seen me play before uh, was really exciting for me. I know one of those uncles used to think he could strike you out, but no more. <laughs> no, he still thinks he can. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to you, Bob. Thanks, Hannah. Here's Lofton at the plate. A single, a pair of RBIs, a stolen base, and his only plate appearance. Also made a fine running catch in the outfield. Kind of amazing to think that Ken Griffey Jr. might wind up as only the second best player to come out of Denora, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but that's the hometown of Stan the Man. One and two. In fact, Musial told me he played basketball and baseball in high school in the 30s with Ken Griffey Jr.'s grandfather. He made the right choice. When you were with the Cardinals, you gave Musial a lot of tips, didn't you, Bob? Yes, I did. Every time I went in his restaurant, Stan and Biggie's. <laughs> <laughs> Lofton's bat goes flying toward first. He goes walking toward the dugout, fanned by Myers. 
Here's that last breaking ball from Randy Myers. And the bat of Kenny Lofton. You know, talking about people at the All-Star Game and in our booth tonight. Your young son right here, Keith. Nice to have him with us here tonight. Boy, is he happy that oh, his man. two favorite players, Ozzie Smith and Kirby Puckett, had their moments tonight. Myers tried to backhand it. Biggio will have to eat it. A base hit for Will Clark. Well, it's obvious Randy Myers doesn't get himself in a good fielding position after <laughs> he releases the ball. Uh, he falls off towards the third base side. He tries to reach behind him to make this play, but he doesn't. See, he falls off toward third base. No chance to really <laughs> get in position. Ball goes through. No play for Biggio. And yeah. Will Clark has his second base hit. You know, yesterday when I met Bob's son, Joe, he introduced me to his young son, Keith, and he had a baseball in one hand. And I shook his hand, and I, as I shook his hand, the ball fell out of his hand. I mean, I, it was very disturbing for me. I mean, <laughs> kid touched me, he dropped the ball right away. <laughs> Your aura rubs off. I don't know what it is. Bell goes to the opposite field. <laughs> Gwynn lost it momentarily. It appeared in the lights, but he tucks it away. Last chance for the National League. Grissom, Biggio, and then either McGriff or Conine. Back after this from your local station. Tries to close it out as a representative of the Baltimore Orioles and the American League. The only two pitchers that Cito Gaston hasn't used yet are Jason Bure of the White Sox and Ricky Bonus of the Brewers. Now, the only two hitters Jim Fregosi hasn't used are Fred McGriff and Jeff Conine. It'll be Grissom, Biggio, and then one of the two, my guess would be McGriff. And both managers, uh, in talking to them before the game, Bob explained that, especially Gaston, saying he was going to go tell the players who probably wouldn't play that there may not be a chance for them to get in the game. Apologize and say, hey, if I can't get you in the game, uh, don't take it, don't take it the wrong way. As did Jim Fergosi. Marquise Grissom had an opposite field home run off Randy Johnson back in the sixth that gave the National League a brief 5-4 lead. But in the seventh, the American League scored three. Nothing since then. 7-5 Americans. They've got 13 hits. The Nationals have nine. And a costly error by Matt Williams overthrowing Carlos Garcia at second led to two unearned runs, although Garcia was late covering the bag. The American League trying to nail down their seventh consecutive win in a series once dominated by the National League. The Nationals lead at 37 26 with one tie. Oh major gas. Find out what the what that fastball was. Smith reaching back for a little extra that time. Here's another guy Joe. I mean every once in a while you're going to throw you a little something off speed but basically here it is and he's been that way throughout his career. Here's that last fastball. Grissom right through it. Two and two. Foul off. I don't think Smith leaving location aside and there's no question he has better mastery of his pitches this year in Baltimore than he did last year in St. Louis when he struggled and the Cardinals let him go. But I don't think he was throwing this hard a year ago. I don't know if he throws as hard. I don't, I don't I'm, I'm sure he's he's nowhere close to what he was in his prime. He's still up there but uh, it, it's nowhere near what he was a few years back. Drops down a little bad bit. Enough. <laughs> registers 89 and the count is full. So if Grissom can get aboard the tying run would come to the plate. He hangs in. Grissom is hitting 281. Six homers. 30 steals second in the National League to Deion Sanders 32. Fregosi, who played in six All-Star games with the Angels. Gaston played in one as a Padre. It holds at three and two. Well, he swung at ball four twice. A couple of high fastballs from Lee Smith. 
There's that last pitch. High fastball up around the letters. And Grissom just getting a piece. Which used to be a strike. No more. Yeah, when they wore the balloon protectors, talking about the, uh, the American League umpires anyway. Strike zone, much tinier. Grissom finally lays off one. Down to first he goes with a leadoff walk. Well, in his last appearance before the All-Star break, Lee Smith gave up a home run to lose the ball game. And here's the high fastball, just too high, and Grissom lays off. The crime dog, Fred McGriff, comes out of the dugout. Capable of tying it with one swing. He'll get a chance next. If Biggio gets aboard, one swing could win it for the National League. There's McGriff with 23 home runs and 63 not home in the first half. Only man in this century to lead both the National and American Leagues in home runs. Biggio. As Grissom is chased back, he is hitting 320. He's stolen 25 bases. Hard to believe he began his career as a catcher. They had to get him out from behind the plate with his speed and his bat. 0 and 2. And that's what Lee Smith does now. He will paint the outside corner with a breaking ball, whereas in the past, he really just overpowered the hitters. And I think it need, he needed the change to go to the American League. That is more of a breaking ball league, whereas in the National League, he still wanted to overpower the hitters. Hit hard but foul. One of those hanging breaking balls right there, Joe, or a cut fastball. But uh, as you said, he's, he, he'll throw the breaking stuff now. Every once in a while, a changeup, but he tries to paint on you. Here it is one more time. That looks like a splitter. That's exactly what it is. Split finger fastball. Hardly any rotation on the ball, and Bijou out in front of it and ripped it foul. Biggio has 35 doubles. That's second in the majors to Nabla. A two base hit here would make things very interesting. Mm -hmm. We're in the ninth. 7 5 American League. Just got a piece of it. Cito, four division titles, two world titles with the Blue Jays, but hard times this year. Hard to believe the defending pennant winners, each well under 500 well, at the midpoint. That's amazing, Bob. It really is. Look at that Toronto ball club. Again on 0 2. And again, he hangs in. Fred McGriff next. Fergosi told us before the game he wanted to save McGriff for a late inning situation. Up high. He had Jeffries and he had Bagwell, so he couldn't really work McGriff in in the field, speaking of Fergosi. Had to give Jeffries and, and Bagwell their turns at bat. But now it'll be McGriff in the ninth in the clutch. The one two pitch. Two and two to Biggio. You know, Joe, in difference to Smith a few years back, when he, I mean, reached back, he ain't worried about painting the corners. Here he's trying to hit the outside and he missed off the outside corner. But years ago, a couple of years back, when this guy had the good fastball, there was no messing around. It was no. here it is, go get it. And he steps off. Big Lee at age 36. Leading the American League in saves. In fact, leading the majors. And that one also makes the seats. Well, as intimidating as Lee Smith is with his size and with the great fastball, though, you, 
he never really intimidated the hitters. He didn't knock anyone down, you know, 0 and 2. He basically would come inside, but not, he didn't knock very many people down. So he's done it straight laced. Terrific at bat for Biggio. It really is. Smith has thrown him everything so far. The splitter, fastball, off speed. He smacks it down at third. Cooper comes up with it. Safe at first. Biggio keeps them out of the double play, and not many right handed hitters would have beaten that because the ball was smoked down at Cooper. I was still a little surprised that he beat it, but watch now. What happens here is watch Cooper. He takes one extra step there. That's where he lost the double play. But again, real good hustle there by Biggio. He beats the play at first base. But most right handed hitters, you're right, would have been out on this. They turn it very well. Good hustle by Biggio. Not blocked. Grissom puts a little pressure on him, but he gets off a good throw. So that sustains the drama because McGriff is the tying run at the plate. Smith with 29 saves for Baltimore. McGriff fouls it off. Well, Cito has played it according to plan. He's got his closer in there. <laughs> and Fergosi's got his man too, Bob. Fergosi trying to stave off the seventh consecutive National League defeat. One on one out, the 0 1 pitch. Smith's 29 saves leads the American League by 10. Rick Aguilera has 19. He's second best. But Bob, you must wonder at age 36, can he keep this up for an entire season? And Baltimore is going to need him down the stretch if they we play the entire season. So that's something you have to be aware of if you're the Orioles. The 0-2 to McGriff. Orioles, of course, right there with the Yankees in the East. Cleveland and Chicago close in the central. White Sox have won six straight. With the possibility of a strike looming, the series right after the break between Cleveland and Chicago takes on urgency. Players remember the split season of 81. Don't know when the season might resume. That'll make the seats, as Mike Hargrove, the Indian manager, said. We've got to play all these games as if it was September. You might see some strange things. Absolutely. Guys going on yep. three days rest and whatever yep. else as the strike date looms. Mm -hmm. And that's been much of the talk here along with the all of the celebrating that's gone on with the all-star game I'm a little bit surprised that Biggio doesn't take second base because they're not holding him on and he can at least stay out of the double play Will Clark way behind him and Biggio's very good base dealer there he goes and the ball is sky to left center field Lofton goes back Lofton to the fence she's gone from Lee Smith down and out over the plate but Freddie McGriff drives it over the left center field wall. And Free Rivers is alive. Well yesterday in that home run hitting contest McGriff was the leader until Griffey hit. And here tonight on a fastball down low and away he got it off. And he's the leader again tonight. Absolutely he is the leader. Yep. Tied at seven in the ninth. Here's Bagwell. I mentioned earlier Lee Smith gave up a home run in the ninth inning to Mark McGuire. 
on Sunday to lose the ball game. The Orioles lost to Oakland. Also in the ninth, in the ninth. Yeah. right. Oh, and two to Bagwell. Had a single his last time up. Will Cordero is next. Strength against strength, and McGriff was better. Toward the middle. Smothered, and Knobloch scrambles to his feet with a terrific play. Great play by Knobloch, Joe. Very good play. This is the toughest play for a second baseman. Anything to your right. But watch how quickly he gets up after he makes the stop. No contest at first base either. Look, he gets up very quickly, gets rid of the ball, gets Bagwell by about five steps. Excellent play here by Knobloch. He plays on AstroTurf, so he knows how to play AstroTurf. And that's an excellent play there. Cordero. Now, unless the National League scores here with two outs in the bottom of the ninth, we're looking at an interesting situation. The managers rightly try to get everybody in. Now the benches are depleted. This is a non-DH game in the National League Park. Weird things could happen here if this game goes 12-13 innings. Cordero grounds it down to Cooper. We go to the 10th. McGriff kept it alive. The 65th All-Star game is tied at 7. Fred McGriff shook up Three River Stadium and left Lee Smith shaking his head. We go to the 10th, tied at 7. This is, as McGriff stays in the game at first base, the ninth extra inning game out of 65. And the National League has won all eight previous extra inning games, most recently 1987 in Oakland, a scoreless game until Tim Raines got a double that broke it open in extra innings. Doug Jones is in. Now the Phillies top bullpen guy throws that palm change. Three time all star with Cleveland in the American League once with Houston. Now his fifth overall appearance. We talked about Lee Smith being overpowering before and coming full cycle throwing a lot of breaking balls. Doug Jones is the same. This guy got a great change. Yeah. Of pace. Now he's great a change up. off speed pitcher change up pitcher. Sierra Ripken and Rodriguez. 0-2 oh as Jones is ahead. Brett Saberhagen is the only pitcher now that Fregosi hasn't used. Jeff Conine is only reserve. The 0-2 pitch to Ruben Sierra. Line drive, base hit. Over Biggio at second. Jason Bure, the right-hander of the White Sox, is throwing in the American League bullpen. He and the Brewers' Ricky Bonus are the only pitcher Cito Gaston hasn't used, and Travis Fryman of the Tigers is the only hitter he hasn't used. Ripkins one for four, doubled off the wall in right center his last time up. How big was that double that they didn't score him? Bobby let off the inning with a double and couldn't score him. Back in the eighth. Rip hitting 306 for the year. There's a strike. There's Travis Fryman. Right handed batter. As is Conine, the only hitter left for Fregosi. Outside. You know, if this thing goes deep into extra innings, it's interesting, it's exciting, but it's a manager's nightmare. Because somebody might have to pitch four or five innings and blow himself out for a while. I don't mean hurt his arm, but take himself out of commission for the better part of a week for his own ball club when the season resumes. That's in the seats. In the 1967 game, which went 15 innings at Anaheim, Catfish Hunter pitched the last five and gave up the game-winning home run to the man seated just next to us broadcasting the game on television for the Spanish speaking audience Tony Perez I 
I think the both managers have to be more aggressive now, Bob. I hit the bat, I believe. Darren Fletcher, the Expo catcher, is chasing after it just in case, but it did hit the bat as Ripken went down. Here it is again, an inside runner. A little fastball coming inside from Jones. And Ripken, it looked for a moment like that ball hit him in the wrist, but it did hit up around the barrel of the bat. There it is right there. You know, when you think about the streak, approaching 2,000 games, mm -hmm. pursuing Garrick, first of all, with all due respect, and a world of respect is due to one of the great players of all time, Lou Garrick, he played first base. Ripken plays shortstop, a more demanding position. And you think of all the things that could happen, like on a pitch like the one just previous. You could be hit by the pitch. Mm -hmm. You could be taken out on a pivot. Spike. You yeah. could be spiked. Up at second. Yeah. Absolutely. Heck, you could fall down the steps and stub your toe at home. Anything could happen. <laughs> Definitely a more demanding position than the first base that Garrett played. The 2-2. Two -two. I asked him, when you get about 10 games away next year, assuming it happens, are you going to kind of walk around your house more gingerly? Say to your wife, hey, honey, would you cut this sandwich just in case? Why don't you open that car door and wait till I'm all the way in before you shut That was his comment. He said he didn't think about stuff like that, didn't he? It's because he has work to do, and I have nothing better to do than sit around and think of these things. Sierra at first. He led off with a single. We're in the 10th. Tied at 7. Struck him out. Good fastball from Jones. He got Ripken looking for the off speed up and threw a fastball right by him. About 84 miles an hour. They were talking about Greg Maddox not throwing that hard, but he said if a car's coming at you at 85 or 90, you really can't tell the difference. <laughs> so if you set him up with the changeup, that 84 mile an hour fastball mm -hmm. looks like the 90 mile an hour fastball. And now here's Rodriguez. He and Ripken have gone the distance. He's one for four. From Vega Baja, Puerto Rico. And Fryman is on deck. Hit toward the hole, and that's through there. Let's see what Sierra does. Gwynn charging, and Ruben will hold at second. You know, Tony Gwynn obviously is one of the great hitters of all time but when he first came up to the big leagues Joe he was not much of an outfielder and he worked and worked especially at what we just saw charging ground ball hits well he has worked on his entire game and he is a scientist as far as I'm concerned he has a master's degree in playing baseball he charges the ball very well holds Sierra at second base So here's Fryman, the last hitter on Cito Gaston's bench. That's out of play. What would happen is the pitchers would have to hit. Fryman with a happy history against Doug Jones. Back when Jones was with Cleveland, Travis is hitting 285 for the year, 13 homers, 64 RBIs. You can put a lot of K's in the scorebook next to his name, though. He's already struck out 99 times. In the air to right. The ball really carrying tonight, but the ballpark will hold this. Gwynn makes the catch. Sierra tags. Rodriguez remains at first. Runners at the corners now with two out. I talked about managers having to be more aggressive in these situations because they're running out of players. I wouldn't be surprised. You see a double steal because Rodriguez runs well. He stole eight bases last year. And Sierra runs well from third. A double steal after two strikes might be in order here. Knobloch the hitter 0 for 2. Rounded a short struck out. Well, this guy, no matter no matter what he does, Joe, talking about Doug Jones, as I said before, he's got a great changeup. 
but he likes to pitch inside too. He's one of those guys, despite the fact that he's not a hard thrower, is not afraid to challenge, afraid to come inside. So Fryman hit for Smith. Beret was throwing. We'll see him in the bottom of the tenth. Knoblock. Now behind on the count 0 and 2. Well, Joe, it's long been your theory that maybe unlike 20 years ago, all-star games are decided by the bench, not so much as the starters these days. And that's exactly what is happening here tonight. Threw it by him. His second strikeout of the inning. Two hits for the American League, but they strand two to the bottom of the tenth after these messages from your local station. We go 27 years. Anaheim, July of 1967. Tony Perez takes Catfish Hunter deep. And it's the deciding blow in the longest All-Star game in history. It went 15 innings. Now, the rules do provide that once a game is in extra innings, a pitcher can work more than three. They're limited to three within a regulation game. There's Tony Perez and his wife, Patuka. Major League Baseball International broadcasting the game to over 60 million people in 139 countries in eight languages, including Spanish, of course, and Tony is handling those duties. Another Tony, Gwynn, to start it. Moises Salou next, and then Darren Fletcher. Jason Bray now. White Sox right-hander on. Win has a double in four trips. Breaking ball in there. Ferre pitched five and a third on Saturday in his last outing. So he's on two days rest here. Nine and two. ERA 3.56. Chopped over the mound. They'll have no play. Even if Knobloch could have flagged it down, which he couldn't. So Gwynn is two for five. Which, in a sense, is a typical night. And that's, that's why. 400. That's why Tony Gwynn is such a good hitter, though. Beret was ahead of him, makes a good pitch, and watch me. Just hits this with nothing but hands. There's a curveball breaking down. Look at he just reaches out, chops it back through the middle. They sit. Tony Gwynn hitting 383, entering the game. His single season high was 370. In 1987, he's a career 332 hitter, counting the first half of this season. Wade Boggs, highest lifetime batting average, 335, so Gwynn is close. Moises Alou. Fastball up and away. Kind of hard thrower, Jason Bure with a good breaking ball. Although the breaking, as you said, Joe, the breaking ball that, that Gwynn hit, not a bad pitch. No. 0 2 curveball. Lou is pretty much a first ball hitter. The first strike he sees, he will be hacking. First at bat of the night for him. Swinging a drive into the gap in left center field. And up against the fence. This could do it. Being waved home is Gwynn. They got a play to Rodriguez. Safe. Safe. And the six game drought is over for the National League. Salou was stretched out on the turf at Bush Stadium, dislocated left ankle, fractured lower leg, his leg grotesquely twisted, and you would have bet his career was in jeopardy. He has come back to hit 331 with 18 homers in the first half and to drive home the game winning run with a double to left center in his lone at bat in this 1994 All Star game in 10 innings. 
The National League ends the American League six game winning streak. Right here. Eight to seven. Let's go to Johnny Bench with well, Moses Salou. Four innings ago, Moses. You said it and I did it. I was just lucky to get another at bat. Uh, I wanted to do something good for the team. Thanks to Freddie, tie it up. He should be the hero. And, and first All-Star again. I got a chance to play, and I think I did pretty good. You sure did. A lot of inexperience on the National League team, but it proved to be a big win. Again, up there, Bob, the National League comes through an extra inning. <laughs> the base of the wall on the fly Albert Bell's relay to Ripken and Ripken's throw right on the money to Rodriguez couldn't have been much closer uh, they might have had him but Paul Rungi was right there here's another angle now we get another look at it but how about the coaching job of Jimmy Leland at third he never stopped him and a perfect relay throw by Ripken they knew they had a play on him here's Gwynn we get a different angle and he's in there. He is he's in, in there. there. He's Absolutely. Safe. Great call by Ronnie. Absolutely. From that angle, you could see the yep. tag was high on the leg. So even though the ball beat him, Rodriguez can't get it down. He's in right and there. Gwynn is in there. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Well, yep. just a moment ago, yep. Joe, you said the National League should become more aggressive. Nobody out after right. Gwynn opened the inning with a single. And Jimmy Leland did not hesitate. He waved them home. Well, you're running out of players. You have to do something. Let's go to Greg Gumbel. All right, Bob, I am here with the most valuable player of the 1994 All-Star Game, Fred McGriff of the Atlanta Braves, and Kurt Ritter from Chevrolet to make the presentation. Kurt? Well, Fred, there are home runs, and then there are home runs. I'm sure you'll remember that one forever. On behalf of Chevrolet and all of our dealers across Canada and the United States, I'd like to present you with the Chevrolet MVP trophy. Appreciate it. Thank you. As well, we'll be donating in your name an Astro van to the Special Olympics. Once again, congratulations. Thank you. Fred, the hour is late, but there can't be a more dramatic home run than the one you hit to tie the game in the ninth inning. And you haven't been able to stop smiling since you got over here. Tell me your feelings. Oh, well, at first, I was just hoping I'd get at bat. You know, it was getting late, and uh, Fergosi hadn't called on me yet. So I'm like, man, I got to get at bat. And then I finally get at bat, and I'm telling myself, be aggressive, you know, take your hacks, you know, and uh, lead them me a fastball down and away, and I hit it out. Congratulations. They're laughing and smiling, I'm sure, down in Atlanta as the National League, Bob, has broken a six-game losing streak. Back to you. Moises Alou, who began his career in Pittsburgh before being traded to Montreal for Zane Smith, wins it after Fred McGriff had tied it in the ninth with the two-run pinch homer off Lee Smith. Wins singled and scored the winner. Driven home by Alou. Doug Jones the winner. Beret the loser. Later tonight on NBC, join us for The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Followed by Late Night with Conan O'Brien and later with Greg Kinnear. That's all coming up next except on the West Coast. And it comes up after your local news. For Bob Euchre, Joe Morgan, Greg Gumbel, Hannah Storm, and Johnny Bench, I'm Bob Costas. So long from Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. The Nationals finally break through. They win it. 8-7. to seven. Good night. This program has been produced by the Baseball Network in association with NBC Sports.